Tonight's episode of Astonishing Legends is brought to you by 4hymns.com, The Great Courses Plus, and our contributors at Patreon. Resurrection Mary has shown us that she is so much more than just Chicago's most famous ghost. She is an icon of folklore. Her story evolving almost moment to moment. We've taken great pleasure in getting to know her and diving into all of the tales of her dancing and wandering along Archer Road in search of a ride home. Like all great stories, however, our version of this one must draw to a close. So tonight, in the final part of our series on her, we're going to take an in-depth look at her connections to so many ghostly women just like her from all over the world. And along the way, we'll look for parallels between her and those other apparitions that seem to have so much in common with her. We're also going to hear a story from a friend that turns the idea of the vanishing hitchhiker on its head. So sit back, relax, and get ready for our last ride to Resurrection Cemetery. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. Of the 28 versions in which the driver learns that the hitchhiker suffered a violent death, 13 are automobile accidents, and in 10 of these, the girl or woman was killed precisely at the spot where she was picked up. From The Vanishing Hitchhiker by Richard K. Beardsley and Rosalie Hankey, California Folklore Quarterly, October 1942. Join us tonight for the final part of our series on Resurrection Mary. And we're back. A final reminder, since this is our last show before we go, we're dark next week because we will be in Ohio for the Kent Paranormal Weekend on April 27th, 28th, and 29th of 2018. So if you're in the area, come on by. Now, we are flying in on the 27th. We're getting there kind of late, so we're not making any commitments that night, but we're going to try and be hanging around if we can get from Cleveland to Kent in mm-hmm. enough time. We have a presentation at 5 p.m. on Saturday and then a Q&A at 2 p.m. on Sunday, along with several other activities that we'll be participating in, mostly hounding Jim Harold for autographs. <laughs> right. Um, Forrest, did you get that ghost meter? Because we're going on a ghost hunt. So. Oh, you mean the K2. Yeah, yes, of you, course. that's the one Rob K said to get. Rob uh, Christofferson, yeah. our friend at Our Strange Skies, right. has experience in uh, ghost hunting and that kind of stuff. So. That's right. That's the standard one everyone usually gets. You'll, you'll, you'll recognize it. Yeah. I got to actually place the order. I've been you looking, at, I've been looking at models. You, well, you know what? If, if it doesn't come in time, we'll just use what Marie and Cogs used, which was a stud finder. <laughs> it, it's got lights. It looks about the same. For finding that yeah. particularly good looking ghost. Um, <laughs> Who's holding a nail. Yeah. As always, thank you for supporting our sponsors. Uh, between that and our wonderful Patreon supporters, we can pay our bills and keep the show free. Now, as I just said, we're going to be off next week, but we'll be back with a new show the week after, and I wanted to give you guys a heads up about that episode. Bear with us here. We know the Amelia Earhart mystery is not everyone's cup of tea, and that's fine, but we have an interview, which we're recording in a few days, with a man that I cannot wait to talk to about it, William Snavely. Yeah, you know, folks, seriously, you're not going to want to miss this one because Mr. Snavely is currently the only man in the world in the history of the search for Amelia Earhart that has definitely found an airplane. And its location lines up with a possible and maybe even probable flight path for her. We've seen pictures, and it sure looks a whole lot like an Electra 10E, her aircraft. Islanders from the area where it lies in protected waters have dived on it a few times, and what they've seen is mind-blowing, especially taken in conjunction with an eyewitness account of it crashing there in the late 1930s. Yeah, Mr. Snavely is about to go back to where this plane is and get more information, and thanks to a connection courtesy of the team at Chasing Earhart, we're lined up to interview him about the impending expedition. We obviously can't know for sure at this time, but there's more than a fair reason to believe that this man may have actually found the holy grail of aviation mystery. And you're only going to hear about it from either Chasing Earhart or us. So don't miss our next show if you want to be in the know before everyone else. Yeah, this could be the pulling the thread on the whole mystery sweater here. This could be it. This could and, be it. And there's a lot of questions that it could also 
ask new questions. If it is the plane, if it is, and it might not be, I want to make that clear, might not be. Right. But if it is the plane, it could also lead to finding her remains and Fred Noonan's remains. Exactly. But it may also open a whole new can of questions. Well, that's, like, that's the road I'm going down, which is, and I'll just say this, it could be another plane. And it, there could also be other people in it. So there's a lot to consider there, big picture stuff. But anyway, that show, I promise you it's going to be interesting. So check it out. No matter how you feel about how many times we talk about Amelia Earhart, (laughs) we promise you're going to enjoy it. We're going to solve it, folks. (laughs) Oh, hey, guess what, by the way? Mm. I was wrong about Dennis Farina. I will say that I got it off a website somewhere, but of course now I can't find anything to corroborate my error. (laughs) Sure. He is not buried at Resurrection Cemetery. Yeah. A listener wrote in to, to tell me about this. He is actually buried at Mount Carmel. Oh, with Al Capone. Yeah. I mean, not, not next to him, but no, you know, I'm no, saying like at yeah. the same cemetery, there are a lot of other famous people buried there. And it's not that far away, actually. No, it's, it's not. It's, I think it's kind of almost due north. Yeah. Or, or it's, it's north of the area. So we're not that far off. But Not yeah. that far off. Yeah. But yeah, so he's not, would have been exciting museum. But Richard T. Crow is definitely no, uh, that's, in there with Mary. And he's true. the one that made her famous. So that's, that's, right. that's pretty cool. Here's where I want to start tonight. Now, I know we already talked about the gates in part three, but we have just received some enlightening information about how the Resurrection Cemetery may have been dealing with the gates and the reasons that they may or may not have removed the bars or put them back and had to deal with all that stuff. And I think uh, it's to your credit, because you were the one that said in uh, maybe episode two or three, you said, if anyone out there can tell us a little bit more about Catholic procedures associated with this. Yeah, well, the administrative angle, because in a way, it's a business. And we've talked about this before. It's how does a business handle these kind of things when they happen? And we put the question out there to the listeners, if anybody could come forth and enlighten us about how the Catholic Church might want to deal with this and why they did what they did, or are we misunderstanding something? And we put that question out there, and we got an answer. Ask and ye shall receive. This is one of my favorite things about the show having gotten to the size that it's at. We have a lot of really amazing listeners from all walks of life, all over the world. And this guy is someone that I've actually been communicating with on Twitter and via our email for several months now. His name is Brother Richard. And he is a Capuchin Franciscan friar from Ireland. Points out himself that he is an avid listener to (laughs) Astonishing Legends. (laughs) Which is, that's awesome in itself. Yeah, he's a very cool guy. He checks in with us quite frequently and provides us with some interesting information. So with regard to to Forrest's question about, can we get some more insight about how the Catholic Church may have looked upon this situation with the gates and Resurrection Mary leaving her handprints on them? And he sent us an email, which we just got in, and uh, we wanted to read that. We're going to start tonight's episode by reading this email from uh, Brother Richard. Hi, all you Astonishing Legends folks. I hope this finds you all well. I've been listening to the podcasts, of course, and really enjoying them. Yesterday, I got to listen to the third part of your series on Resurrection Mary and noted your wonderment at the removal of the bars and possible denial of the event by the diocese. So I thought I'd throw in a few thoughts on this, seeing as I've had some experience dealing with hauntings, etc., over my years as a Catholic priest who belongs to an order that are traditionally called in to deal with such things. Firstly, who would have ordered the bars to be removed? To say that the archdiocese ordered their removal may very well be accurate, but a diocese operates at various levels. It would not necessarily mean that the archbishop was even consulted on their removal. In fact, the management of the cemetery would be within their right to dispose of the bars and gates without consulting the higher-ups. I'm not saying that the decision wasn't made at a high level, just that it didn't need to be, and that it would still be accurate to say in such a case that the archdiocese ordered their removal. Secondly, if we accept for a moment the non-supernatural thesis as to how the gates were damaged, it is quite possible that the combination of the place, a cemetery with an already high ghostly profile, and the local acceptance of such phenomena could lead to the augmentation of the legend to include the twisted bars. I say this because I have seen the same happen in the grounds of one of our own friaries where a large concrete statue of one of our saints was reported by the local children to be a, quote, real monk covered in concrete after an accident, (laughs) end quote. (laughs) This led to us having to constantly deny the frankly crazy story as it got passed down from older kids to younger ones, delighting in their ability to scare them with a whole backstory developing, until we eventually had to put a sign up describing who the statue was. Legends grow, and the creepier ones grow really well. Thirdly, if we accept the supernatural origin of the damaged gates, then what would this mean in the Catholic understanding? 
Well, in our few thousand years of dealing with the supernatural, a number of categories of, quote, ghostly events have been delineated. Briefly, these include, but are not limited to, get out your pens and papers, folks. This is really amazing stuff. We're going to put this in the show notes, and I'm going to be consulting it for the entire rest of the time we're doing this podcast. Well, talk, <laughs> talk, about, talk about rules and uh, descriptions yeah, this and is, definitions. This yeah. is so cool. All right. So here's the uh, delineation of ghostly events. Number one, an apparition of a saint or an angel. Number two, an apparition of a blessed soul, someone already in heaven who appears to confer information or guidance. Number three, an apparition of a purgatorial soul, also known as a, quote, holy soul, someone who is moving through a state of spiritual purification so as to eventually enter heaven. Such souls are saved and blessed, but must still pass through purificatory states before entering fully into heaven. They may be allowed to manifest so as to seek prayer and spiritual assistance to help them on their way or to wake up the earthly-minded to the reality of the next life. The church traditionally dedicates the whole of the month of November to prayer for them. Number four, a clairvoyant vision of a past event. Not a soul present now, but a sensitized vision of a past event, usually one that included a lot of emotion at the time. This is something that a sensitive person sees given the right circumstances. The ghost, in quotes, in such experiences is not sentient and does not communicate. This may be seen through natural sensitivity or through the graced permission of the divine. I thought this was interesting because this reminded me of several stories we've covered for us, but uh, one being the uh, Queen Mary story and what was just about Marty and Alice yeah. saw in their room. They saw the guy, but they weren't. It's the stone tape thing that we always bring up. Just this idea that you are seeing something, but you can't interact with it because it's like he said, which I never thought about this. It's yeah. not sentient. No, it's a visual echo. Yeah. So, and again, we've talked about that quite a bit, but you don't know really because uh, it's hard to <laughs> nail that thing down or ask them at the time. You don't know what's going on there. But that definition I love because that explains a lot of things that people see that, again, might be an echo going all the way back to, remember Mark's story about his mother seeing a British redcoat out of the corner of her eye. Yes, Forrest is talking about uh, Mark Brugnoni, who was a guest on the show. He told the story of the Laughing Indian as right. well as the flirting ghosts of Norway. And I think it was the Laughing Indian story where he mentioned that his mom had seen, like you said, the redcoat out in the woods, but you couldn't look directly at him. You could only see exactly. him out of the corner of right. your eye. Yeah, so it's some kind of a visual reflection that you're seeing, like an echo. Yeah, so that yeah. makes sense. I'm glad he mentioned that. Okay, so we just got a few more here. Number five, this is great. There's poltergeist is on the list. There's two types. Number five is poltergeist type one, a range of psychic, psychokinetic phenomena which may be associated with living human beings who are in high emotional stress states. Number six, poltergeist type two, manifestations of purgatorial souls seeking recognition and prayer. I really want to talk about that. We'll come back to that in a second. Number seven, demonic spirits seeking to confuse or frighten. Number seven is the one you really want to stay away from, folks. We speak from experience. Number eight, elemental spirits. These can be confusing and can draw parasitically from human emotion. All right, so reframing that, these are the delineated categories of ghostly events, according to Brother Richard. He goes on to say, what would seem to be happening with the gates at Resurrection Cemetery is a fairly typical manifestation of numbers three, four, and six. Three being the apparition of a purgatorial soul who is saved or blessed but must still pass through the purificatory state before entering heaven. That's three. And then he's saying it also might be a combination of the clairvoyant vision of a past event, which we just talked about a little bit, the whole stone tape idea. And then number six, poltergeist type two, a manifestation of a purgatorial soul seeking recognition in prayer. He goes on to say, the Vatican has a whole museum dedicated to manifestations such as these. And while not common, they are fairly typical. I didn't know about this museum. I would like to get to it. Mm. So if the event was such a combination why would the gates be removed? To my mind, it would be to downplay the cemetery as a place of haunting, as this often leads to groups not of Catholic belief who want to either trample all over the cemetery and disturb its atmosphere of prayer and reflection, or worse, even conduct seances or rituals that may, unknowingly, tend towards calling in 
darker entities, or at the very least bring fear and emotional distress to those participating, or to the families of the deceased. In the meantime, masses and prayers would have been offered for the soul of the departed who appeared if the event was judged to be genuine. And then he goes on to add, anyway, I hope the above is helpful to some degree, or maybe it caused even more wonderings. If so, feel free to ask anything. I have a few interesting ghostly stories I can share with you all sometime too. Peace to you all and blessings on the work. That's the letter from Brother Richard. For our followers who are on Twitter, if you want to follow him, his handle is at bro Richard, B-R-O-R-I-C-H-A-R-D. That's probably the best use of bro I've ever seen. <laughs> and <laughs> Authentic and accurate. Authentic, yeah. yes. And, and just to recap his background, he is a Capuchin Franciscan friar from Ireland. So, Brother Richard, thank you so much for sending this in. We actually did a last-minute pickup to get this into our show. It is right now, Friday, April 20th, and this show is probably going up uh, tomorrow, Saturday the 21st. So I wanted to thank you for sending that along. Forrest, I do want to talk a little bit about some of these categories. What's really fascinating to me, I guess, is um, this does seem to cover a wide range of anything we've ever talked about, in my opinion, yeah, <laughs> in, uh, in terms yeah. of ghostly phenomena. Sure. Which it's interesting that somebody's able to make that list and you can apply these categories. And then I also like that he mentions it's, you know, it's not one thing or the other, which is sort of what I was saying about Mary in the first place. Everybody's yeah. just trying to make her Mary. This is Mary. This is her category, when to me it seems much broader. This uh, defines in a general way what we're getting at with this whole series, because I think as we said towards the beginning of the series, it's easier for people to wrap their heads around one particular thing. And that's why they want to attach it to a person who has passed on. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, here's Mary. That's the person. Well, I don't really believe in ghosts, but if I did, it would be the ghost of this person here who died tragically on this date. It all lines up. It all makes sense. But from all the stories we've heard, it fits a, a wide range of behaviors and experiences. Right. And that need for that folklore, that package that, to wrap it all up in, that comes back to the need for cognitive closure. I, yeah. I saw something I can't understand. I've got to frame it. So here's how I'm going to frame it. I'm right. going to say this fits into the Resurrection Mary thing. And oh, that was that girl that got thrown through the windshield and this car accident Y that happened on this night. And to me, that's trying to nail it down a little too much. And that's what allows you, in a lot of ways, I think, putting that package on something like Resurrection Mary does make it easier to tell and share the story. And it's part of what grows the story. And, you know, one thing that's not on this list, you know, I don't see anything like it is our sort of thing that we always come back to, the tulpa or the thought form is not necessarily here. And we don't have any scientific proof whatsoever that those are even capable. That's a longer discussion and probably a show in itself. But I do th also think that part of what folklore does when it gets to where it's creating a real well-defined picture for somebody like Mary, is that it allows, if tulpas are possible, it allows a kind of focus. It puts a lens that focuses the creation of this apparition. Yeah. Because everyone's thinking about the same thing. So that's if you believe it's a manifestation of human consciousness, like of collective human consciousness, which is, you know, yeah. getting back to Art Bell, God rest his soul, is something I think he would have talked about. So anyway, I think this is really interesting. I do like how you can apply this to a lot of different types of events. And his perspective seems to me to be very level-headed with regard to whether the bars were hit by a truck or Mary did right. it. This is how it would have been dealt with in either scenario. One, the church has had centuries of documenting and dealing with this kind of thing. So, of course, it makes sense to me that they've narrowed this down into definitions. And, boy, just think about all the stuff that they've got in ancient texts uh, hidden away where they have encountered so many strange things over the years and have tried to categorize them. Because not only is it useful to deal with them in a way for us humans here, but also spiritually. So that's interesting. Secondly, if you look at what happened to the gates, one, on the most basic level, it's damage. So you yeah. want to fix it. it right. You know, it's kind of burned and charred. And if it was a prank, as we said, it's a really elaborate and involved prank, which has exposed the pranksters to possible jail time <laughs> or, or at least a fine, because then you'd have to be out there with a welding torch or an arc welder or something, some kind of device, which is going to draw a lot of attention. And obviously the police were called at some point. If it's a prank and that's all it is, or was an accident, you're just going to want to fix it. And that's what they did. 
and this is what I love about Brother Richard, it's like, look at the other side. If it is spiritual, this may be what's going on, and it could be several things. That's why I loved he had several things from this list, which could be happening. And one final thing, addressing Brother Richard's funny story about the person encased in concrete, there was a thousand-year-old Buddhist monk found inside a statue that somehow came from China and ended up in a market in the Netherlands. So <laughs> it does. Right, yeah, so it all, happens. Check all your statues. That's, <laughs> that's the point there. All right, so that wraps up the story itself, the story of Mary, but there's so much more to talk about with regard to where the story of her, this folklore that surrounds her, whether it's true or not, where that falls in the worldwide ghostly zeitgeist. Well, yes, as Brother Richard is pointing to in these definitions, there could be several different types of spiritual things going on, but what we want to know is why is this lady in white so pervasive around the world? Well, the legend of Resurrection Mary seems to fit into two different but related folkloric traditions, and that is the Vanishing Hitchhiker urban legend and a type of ghost story or legend that centers around an encounter with what's called a lady in white or a white lady. And this is a character that seems to be a ghostly global star because it's not just in the U.S., it's not just in Chicago. She could be found pretty Worldwide. much pretty much anywhere. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at just the type of story this is because I think you're going to find this interesting. The elements of the story are not unique to Mary. They're common to a lot of stories, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's just folklore and legend. There could be a lot of other elements at work here, and we're going to hopefully at the conclusion of this section point this out to you, and you can decide for yourself. So first, we're going to take a look at a good scholarly essay about The Vanishing Hitchhiker as a genre of folklore, and it's called The Vanishing Hitchhiker at 55, authored by Gillian Bennett. And this is coming from the journal Western Folklore, volume 57, number one, winter of 1998, and published by the Western States Folklore Society. And so we're just going to kind of uh, summarize and paraphrase different elements of this essay, but also read some parts from it, because it puts this type of story and uh, the idea of the vanishing hitchhiker story into perspective, because, of course, people have studied this. And two of them of note were young anthropologists at the time, Beardsley and Hankey, and they wrote a paper basically in 1942. And what Gillian Bennett has done is take a look at that. And as the title suggests, at the time she published this, or it was published, that paper, that essay, the original one, was 55 years old. So again, that being done in 1942, they were collecting data from the 30s and the 20s. And before that, you know, you didn't have any hitchhikers. I mean, we'd seen before that, yes, there are stories of people hitching a ride in like buckboard wagons and uh, horse-drawn carts and stuff like that. But really with the automobile as a central element and people hitching rides, it wasn't a whole lot of span to study these stories, but they did the best they could. So what this paper does is basically take a look at that original study, which was very well done and one of the most thorough ones for any time, and see how it updates. So we'll, we're going to read some conclusions and some framing with that, and you'll get an idea of, of uh, the elements of the story, and I think you'll get a clearer picture on it. So kind of in the introductory overview here, Gillian Bennett says, quote, Indeed, the vanishing hitchhiker has become perhaps the most frequently collected and widely discussed modern story. Nevertheless, Beardsley and Hankey's original work, as well as being one of the first full-length studies of any contemporary legend, remains perhaps the most complete folkloric examination of the vanishing hitchhiker. So it's a work worth looking at because, again, not many people have taken this seriously. They're kind of the first ones to do it. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. They did this that long ago. They studied a collection of 79 vanishing hitchhiker stories from 60 different locations in the United States. And their first goal was to link the legend with a real-life incident, which they couldn't really do. So then they tried to find the original story. Yeah, they couldn't find a connection to older traditions, so they concluded it was completely new, well, at that time anyway, a product of the previous 20 years or so. Quote, a story that is in no sense of survival from an outdated culture, but stands as a fully-fledged representative of the contemporary tale. <laughs> as we know now, they're a little off the mark maybe, but that's early on. So what they're saying is that this seems to be kind of a new legend of its own. That's my interpretation. They couldn't really find a connection to tales like it, at least in the United States, previous to that. Yeah. That's not false, but it doesn't exactly have a lot of foresight, you know, that comment when they made it. 
The other thing is they weren't able to collect stories outside of the U.S., and they said they wouldn't be surprised if the story could be found in any part of the so-called civilized world. Right, because it just seems like a, again, an archetype. Is You're going to hear that word a lot. But it seems like a pattern that is common throughout the world, although, again, they only studied 79 cases in the U.S., but they found some interesting things by studying just those 79. Yeah, so I want to read this section from their paper. By analyzing their corpus of stories, they discovered four variants that they thought were quite distinct. In stories of the version A pattern, the ghost is offered a ride by a motorist, gives an address, and disappears. The motorist calls at the address he has been given, only to be told his passenger has been dead a number of years. They found 49 examples of uh, version A. Now, right. in version B, they found nine examples of this. The traveler offers a ride to an old woman who issues a warning or a prophecy before disappearing from the vehicle. The travelers later receive information that she has been dead some time. In version C, for which they had 11 examples, a young man meets a girl at a dance and offers her a ride home. She has to be put down at a cemetery and disappears. He later finds she is dead, and this is confirmed by some personal possession being left on her grave. In version D, a mysterious old lady carrying a basket is offered a ride and disappears. Later, the travelers discover that they have given a ride to the Hawaiian goddess Pele. Uh Uh-huh. As well as these 75 classifiable texts, they had a number of mixed types. They judged that version A stories were probably the closest to the original story. Version B seems to be limited to the Midwest and dated to a very specific time, 1933, the year of the Chicago Centennial Fair. So they concluded they might be a block apart from the standard hitchhiker. Version C had the most widely scattered distribution, but was the most divergent in that— In the most recent stories, the girl was, they said, more of a pickup than a hitchhiker. They wondered whether this might be a completely different story, which is converging in details to resemble the vanishing hitchhiker, and speculated that the hitchhiker's return to the grave was the typical action of a vampire. Ooh. Yeah. But isn't it curious, all these elements that they're mentioning, and just their broad survey of like, you know, 79 cases that they collected, Yeah, how many elements here sound familiar? Yeah, a lot of them are super familiar. Yeah. Again, this is what happens when I start, you know, honestly... I, I feel unqualified because I, I don't have <laughs> well, any. No, I don't yeah. have any background in right. folklore right. beyond what we've learned in the past several sure, years, sure. and you know, a personal fascination with it. Right. I'm an armchair folklorist, but yeah. well, that's a comfortable place to be. Sure. Well, I, I get this, you know, chicken and the egg idea where I think sometimes you analyze these stories and you say, well, this is all just oral tradition. It started on this one story, and then it branched out into this great big tree of ideas, and then it became stories that got spread all over the world. Right. All from one thing. And because they have a certain ring to them, like a popular song, a super popular song, it just gets caught in everyone's head and everyone shares it with everyone else. And, you know, we all love to sit around the campfire, just ask Jim Harold (laughs) and and tell the spooky stories. It's an oral tradition that probably goes back in terms of campfire to caveman times. So, you know... Remember yeah. when Og got killed by the, you know, <laughs> buffalo? So that, that there's all that stuff going on. But by the same token, sometimes I wonder if stories like this are pervasive because there are people witnessing these events and it's yeah. a product of the civilization. It doesn't mean that it's not happening, even if it's a spiritual happening. Yeah. So you can analyze it all you want, but you're not really defining a mundane explanation for it. You're just saying that it's common. As I like to say, this is what I what I do, and you're maybe skipping a little ahead before our conclusion <laughs> to the section, but that's well, okay. Sorry. Because I no, got, that, I got that, carried away. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. It's like when you read these things, it's like, wait, what? That is the story. Mary has some of these elements. Yeah. How's it fit? Yeah, I knew you're you were gonna go there, me too. Uh the chicken and the egg thing, because are these folkloric stories spurred from real encounters and that's where people get the ideas? Or is it something in our collective consciousness? You know, that's one argument too, is like these stories are embedded. It's the, uh, as I say before, it's, it was the copy of uh, Avatar that was jammed on your phone that you didn't really want. It's just yeah. embedded. You bought it, here's the phone, you, you, you got the story. Are these sightings spurred because somewhere deep in our subconscious we're prone to these types of stories and, you know, we're expecting something like this or we're not, but it's down there in the subconscious. And so we put it together, we retell these stories, they end up having the same uh, modalities here. So that's the kind of the uh, argument that we're heading towards here, which is first, or as I believe, 
most likely a combination of both. I probably don't need to tell you this. Uh oh. <laughs> Did you know that 66% of men lose their hair by age 35? You don't say. Uh, yep. You have hair. A lot of it. Oh, thank I mean, you. it looks great, man. Oh, yeah. I'm the youngster here, and my hair has been moving out of the house for about 15 <laughs> years. It's too late for me. Come on, man. Don't be fatalistic. I'm not. The reality is that when you start to notice your hair getting gone, it's too freaking late. It's a lot easier to keep what you got than replace what's vacated the premises. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, yeah, maybe it is too late for you. Don't be like Scott, folks. I, I mean, you look great, man. Uh, thank you. <laughs> but for you out there, if your hairline is slowly marching towards the horizon, you want to take action now. And that's why we're pretty excited to tell you about our new sponsor, 4 They're a one-stop shop, not just for hair loss, but also skin care and sexual wellness for men. There's nothing like going to a drugstore and having to request assistance in the hair loss aisle because some cabinet is locked. <laughs> or thumbing through a 15-year-old copy of GQ in your doctor's waiting room before you have to tell everyone in the office you're worried about losing your hair. 4 connects you with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat hair loss. These guys are the real deal. Yeah, this isn't snake oil, folks. They have well-known generic equivalents to name-brand prescriptions that help you keep your hair. Prescription solutions that are backed by science. Just visit 4 answer a few quick questions, and a doctor will review them and prescribe you products that are shipped directly to your door. Yeah, they have a beautiful, easy-to-navigate website, and everything you get from them is sent in elegant packaging that you won't feel like you have to hide under the sink in your bathroom either. Uh, don't be like Scott. Wait, I think, I, I think I'm still pretty cool. I mean, just because I'm losing my hair. Order mean, now. Our listeners get a trial month of hymns for just $5 today, right now, while supplies last. See their website for full details. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. Go to 4 slash legends. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash legends. I think they're worried you're not going to remember it, but trust us, once you try them out, <laughs> you'll never forget it. Forhims.com slash legends. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Okay, well, anyway, to come back to the uh, paper here, Bennett says that the authors went through all these variants identifying typical characteristics. Now, you'll also see a lot of these commonalities here from our story that we know so well now. The hitchhiker is always female, either a beautiful girl or a little old lady. Haven't seen that, but that's the other trope. The description of the girl is intended to emphasize the attractiveness, yet hint at her ghostly nature, as we've just heard earlier in the show. She's beautiful but haunting, pale, powdery. Yeah. The clothes are usually never of a strong color. Her dress is never colored, but maybe black or white as it resembles a shroud, possibly, or could be, the story goes, her grave clothes, what she was buried in. Yeah. But basically, the description is intended to add plausibility to the plot by supplying a motive for the driver to give her a ride or a article of clothing, like a coat. So what you're seeing here is that there's certain story elements to the folklorist that keep coming up because... They're needed in the story, you know what I'm saying, to get around. And uh, those of you who are writers out there will know that, like, you have to solve challenges because you need to capture somebody's imagination and make them believe in the story, go with you. What they're saying here is that these oral tradition tales, the same things are happening. There have to be little twists of the story to get you to kind of believe it, you know, to make a callback, the jacket coming back, the look of the girl, the attractiveness of it to get your attention to all this. So that's kind of the summation, as I would put on the, at least this section here, is that what their argument, if you look at it just solely as story, as folklore, and not really ghosts <laughs> or encounters, that they're not calling these people liars. They're just saying that these stories that are being told all have these same elements, and the reason is it's necessary to keep the tradition of telling the story alive and perpetuating. Here's the other thing about it, though, and I get the feeling that Beardsley and Hanke, and I don't know because it was 1940-something when they wrote their paper, and I'm not sure about Gillian Bennett either, but yeah. as far as I can tell, they didn't talk to any eyewitnesses. What they're doing is they're analyzing these stories that they've heard. Yeah. They go around, they talk to people who have heard the stories, and there's lots of those people around. But what we've done and what we do at Astonishing Legends when we can is talk to people who actually witnessed these things and I feel like what you're saying when you say that it's all folklore mm -hmm. is you're saying that all the people that are telling the story 
are storytellers themselves. And I'm not saying you're saying they're lying or no, they're fabricants, right, right. but essentially we have somebody on this show like Mark Rudnicki or we, yeah. we read these stories from the people that wrote into us like Joe Wisniewski about his father, Richard, the Chicago cop or whatever. Right. What we're saying is that these people are all just, you know, they're Andy Griffiths. Andy Griffiths used to tell. That's how he started out. He was a storyteller. It's right. very popular in the South. There's actually some people that still do this. And there's oral tradition there. But these folks, it's not the impression I'm getting when I'm hearing what happened to them. When Mark says, we drove by, but well, it doesn't oh, seem like yeah, no, no. he's fictionalizing no, to- an account. I don't care how much it has in common with however many other people have seen it and it's happened to them. To me, this is a little bit of a clinical analysis that doesn't take into account the humanity behind the people sharing these stories. Absolutely. No, to be clear, though, and to address your point— I think what's being said here is that it's not that these people are professional hucksters and storytellers. It's not the person who started the stories, as we've heard about some of these celebrities, whoever that jerk is out there, just doing it for a laugh, and it it sticks. That's what happens sometimes. I think what they're saying here is that the story, independent of the teller, because it's like Mark and some of our guests, just telling the story makes you, quote unquote, the storyteller. It's not that you're a professional storyteller, but what's happening is that the facets pointed out here by the anthropologists and the folklorists is that the elements of these types of stories make itself perpetuate. And so that's when you get my mom's hairdresser's cousin's brother. I uh, get that. But what I'm saying is All that, the people yeah. that know Mark Rudnicki probably tell Mark's story, but I think it's a different thing right. to hear it from Mark well, or no, the witness in any case or Brian Bethel who experienced the black-eyed kids well, in no, the that's parking what, lot. Yeah, I'm not a different a, thing. I'm not against you. What I'm saying no, I know, is... I'm no, yeah. and I don't mean to be combative, because right. I know you're with me on this. Right. I'm just trying to make a point for our listeners. I think There's what a happens... One thing our good friend Travis Dow said early on, I think at the Huska Castle episode, was that, well, he doesn't really believe in that stuff. He's a ghost tour guide, or has been. And what do you do when a good friend tells you that? It's like, well, I don't know if I can be on board with that, but I trust you. And if that's what you tell me you said, then uh, I'm going with it. We're like that with all the people we get to know who tell us these stories. And if you are that person yourself, if you experience something, you know what that's like. No one has to explain that to you. You know that you're not making up folklore. But I think if... Uh, this I is... didn't make up what happened to me in the bathroom <laughs> well, at the steakhouse. Yeah. Boy, that sounds wrong. Yeah, I know. You probably shouldn't repeat I it. should there's, retract that. Yeah, there's got to be a better way to say if, that. If people don't know what I'm talking about, listen to Archipelousa Part 2, where I shared a story of one of the only supernatural things that's ever happened to me. Yeah. In, I, I would say it was a, a men's room. Yeah. A, sp- <laughs> a spiritual experience. That also sounds bad. Yeah. There's the, no way to put it right. No. The point being is that what these folks are doing is that you can't look at these stories as being true or not true. You look at them as a story. We actually heard from a folklorist in an email, which we're going to get to in a minute, that is actually addresses that point, the viewpoint of a folklorist. They're not interested in the veracity of the story. You're interested in it as a piece of folklore. I know you have to kind of separate your brain out there from that idea. It's that you're not here to judge these people. It's like, well, that sounds like a lot of baloney. You know, it's like, that's not the point of the folklore is to like, well, and that one sounds more true because there wasn't a jacket folded up on the tombstone. Like, no, you're looking at the traits of the story, where they originate, what are the trends, how it affects society and the culture that it comes from. And so you have to separate those things out. So, right, I totally get what you're saying, but I think what they're doing here, and this is helpful for understanding these types of stories in general, not to prove them right or wrong. Again, I don't, you're never going to get proof. You may even be able to take fingerprints <laughs> off those bars if they were burned in, run them through the FBI database, get a hit on it. It's like, oh, that guy died 30 years ago. How did he leave those prints on there? And people still aren't going to believe it. You faked it somehow. You got some ceramic, uh, you know, imprints of the guy's fingerprints. You heated the metal, you put them in there. There's no proof that's going to, like, make you believe. So what we do, though, is we see patterns. That's the one thing we can do, kind of a John Keel approach. What can we do? We can gather these stories. We can analyze them for patterns and see if there's any meaning in it. And so that's, I think, the approach here. I completely agree. The only thing I'm saying, and I, it sounds right. like we're debating. But I know. Not. <laughs> the only thing I'm saying is that for me personally— and this is perspective that I've gained through doing our show. For me personally, there are two categories of stories. Yeah. And this paper only addresses one of them. And those two categories are the story that is retold by the person and people that it did not happen to, which is an overwhelming majority of stories like this. And then the other category is people who personally experienced it. 
those are two different things. And in my opinion, you cannot evaluate, even if both parties are telling the same kind of story, you cannot evaluate the one from the secondhand hearsay point of view with the same tools that you evaluate the ones from the eyewitnesses. Well, it's interesting. It depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to, it's like Kecksburg. It's like, well, yeah, some craft comes down with strange writing, shadowy people show up. Do you see where that story has elements of folklore, all the same things? It's the yeah, men in black. I get all it's that. the weird writing. It's the secretiveness of it. It's the, uh, but it, you know. even as we told that story, we told it all through hearsay. We did not talk to anybody who stood there and looked at that giant acorn. And so right. but that I think it's, yeah. is different than, say, talking to Brian Bethel for Black Eyed Kids or, or talking to Mark Rodnicki about Resurrection Mary. Those are different types of approaches. And so I guess what I'm saying is, for me, this paper is fascinating and all these categories are super fascinating and I'm super interested in folklore and how it propagates. Right. But there's a difference between a first degree experience and every degree below first. Uh, sure. Yeah. Every degree below first falls into the category that this paper addresses. Right. Every degree that is first, the first-hand account, is not addressed by this particular analysis. Yeah, it's a different thing. It depends on what your goal is in categorizing these stories. And so the folklorist, well, it's what these guys tried to do. Beardsley and Hanke, they tried to get the original story. They did research to say, like, where did this thing start? Is this a real incident that happened? It's what we tried to do. But they it's, couldn't find anything. They couldn't find anything. And so we went on the same journey, actually. And found people. We've, now, granted, we no, no. had the benefit well, of technology. But. Here's the thing, Scott. We found people with original stories. We did not find the original Resurrection Mary story. Not saying the person, of course, they'd be passed away by now. We never got to a point where it's like, this is it. There's definitely a woman who was hit, and she fits the description. She was hit on this night. Her boyfriend reported it to the police. There was a hit-and-run driver, and they never caught him. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no great story that matches up and says, this is a great candidate for this person being the ghost of Mary, this is a great candidate for the actual incident, for this to spur. Here's the pattern you can see, uh, this germinating the story, which became uh, a you know, great uh, Chicago tale. We didn't find that. We went looking for it. So what's the next best thing you can do? Well, it's, again, like what we did. We take the stories we can get. We get the eyewitnesses' accounts we can hear. And you try and make some kind of pattern, you collect this, and it's like, well, then you got to make the, your own decision at the end of it. So that's about all these folklorists and anthropologists can do, is that try and find the root of it. If you can't do that, then collect the stories you can from as many original sources, and then you notice the patterns. And so, again, they're not equipped, nor is it their goal to see if these stories are true. It's really to see the patterns of them and how they fit into folkloric tradition. By the way, I just want to say yeah. uh, one quick thing that I didn't get to say in part three when we talked about the gates. There was another story mm -hmm. connected to the gates that I wanted to share. Two days later, a woman called the police after she saw a body on the side of the road outside the gate on the other side of Resurrection Cemetery. Right. This was on August 12th, 1976, and she was at 76th Street and Roberts Road. She was driving a white 1965 Mustang, which had a CB in it. This chick sounds super cool, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm using chick because in the 70s, people said it, and it was oh, okay. you're already in trouble. I'm not yes. being derogatory. Okay. In 1976, August 12th, she gets on the CB radio, probably Channel 9, uh, which was the emergency channel, and calls for help because she's seen a body on the side of the road. Cops show up, no body, and she's just crying in the car, upset. Point is, that was just two days after Pat Homa's experience with the gates at the front of the cemetery. I just think it's really interesting how close together those two events were. And in both cases, there's an apparition involved of a young girl who disappeared. And it's an opposite ends of the cemetery. And not only that, it's close to entry or exit point, egress points for the cemetery, although not the same yeah. one. So sorry, I wanted to point that out. We had that story up our sleeve and we didn't yeah, get a chance to, to use it. Well, okay, so anyway, to wrap up this whole part about uh, the vanishing hitchhiker and folklore, uh, we're not going to go through the whole paper, of course, but I just thought this was an interesting conclusion by Jillian Bennett about the original paper. So here's where Jillian Bennett has noted some updates to the above model that is defined by Beardsley and Hankey that could be useful taking a look at it in modern contemporary terms here. So Bennett says the story has been transmitted much more widely than Beardsley and Hankey thought because it's global and our world since the 1940s 
with an explosion of media outlets has contributed to that. Just think about that, how things, uh, yeah, even back in the forties. Well, there them. you go. <laughs> you have people, you're going around the world with this thing and, uh, wasn't achievable at that time. So that's different as we'll see in worldwide stories and current events or events at that time that has a factor as well. Bennett has found that nowadays their categories are too restrictive and elaborate, and it didn't stand the test of time very well because scholars can now identify texts in which hitchhikers these days are aliens, angels, saints, Jesus, and malevolent spirits, among a bunch of other things. Bennett says it would be simpler nowadays to see the hitchhikers as tending to fall into two large overall groupings, that is, supernatural entities or numinous beings. The word numinous being an English adjective derived from the Latin numen, meaning arousing, spiritual, or religious emotion, mysterious, or awe-inspiring. So that could be not necessarily a supernatural being, but somebody with supernatural powers of some kind, awe-inspiring powers. So, but anyway, and then she could say that uh, they could be further subdivided into uh, the way that their status is discovered. So basically now she goes on to define the stories that we hear nowadays and how those might fit into different categories. Basically, there are the same kind of patterns which we hear in these stories, and a lot of it is how you meet the person when they disappear. You have to go back again to find them. You find out that they've been, they've been dead. You have an article of their clothing, or you go to retrieve yours. It's on the gravestone, and that's the hook. It's like, there you go. She folded it nicely, and it smells like downy. You know, yeah. some, some, it's like, what? That's not possible. That also is another hook to the story. That's all the folklorists are kind of saying is that there's elements to these stories like that button, like I told you, which makes it a good story and ensures that it keeps getting repeated and told. Just yeah. quickly, I want to say that I think, and I've said, I think I've said this before, in terms of folklore and how this stuff goes on and on, I think a lot of times when the person that had the thing happen to them wants the second person to remember it, I think they embellish a little bit. And when the second person wants the third person to remember it, they embellish and they might add that detail. Well, and that's how they get more and more outrageous. It's but Chinese some, whispers. Right. Yeah. But somewhere there's an original story. And so it's like you always say about eyewitness, you know, saw somebody was hit by a red truck and run over. And it's like, well, maybe the truck wasn't red. But still, at the root of the story, there was a truck that ran over somebody. And that's the part that keeps us interested when we're looking at stuff like this is trying to find out where it all started. And for me, with Resurrection Mary, it doesn't necessarily start with figuring out who Mary is. What it starts with is figuring out if all these people are picking up hitchhikers. It doesn't matter who she is to me whether she's Mary Brigovi or Mary whatever, right. in which way we found this 13-year-old that might have been her or whatever. Yeah. The point is a ton of people are seeing somebody on the side of the road and it's freaking them out. Well, it's, whether it, they run over her, she yeah. gets in her, or they turn around, she's not there. There is a poignancy to this, and you're bringing up the Rich Haddam uh, discussion that we had here before. Yeah, and just quickly for people who might be new to the show, Rich Haddam is a frequent guest on the show and a friend of ours who's a screenwriter. He actually adapted the screenplay for The Mothman Prophecies, and he's been on several episodes. So if you ever hear us bring up Rich or Rich Haddam, that's who we're talking about. Yeah, that's Rich. We've had him on before. He's a good friend. He's he's overdue, I think, to bring him back. So we'll have to figure out uh, where he's relevant. <laughs> so that's actually the story, though, that Jim Harold tells about, I believe it was his brother, unfortunately, that passed away. And the whole family's coming back from the service at the cemetery. And this brother's favorite Lawrence Welk song comes on the radio. And my point is like, well, there you go. You could take that as a message. You could not. Doesn't matter. That's really heartwarming to me. I'm going to take that as a message. Then Rich says, well, no, I would want to know, call the radio station, get the playlist. I want to talk to the disc jockey. This is something we can nail down. Did you intend to play that? How'd you get that idea? You know, and that's kind of your point. It's like, I don't need to know all that mm -hmm. for it to be, have meaning for me. I'll settle with that came on the radio. The whole family heard it. We felt this joy in remembering the person that passed. That's enough for us. I don't need to know what was in the disc jockey's mind when he put it on the playlist or where he got the album. Although you could try and find that out. So there are two ways of looking at that. Yeah, but all you're going to do is get to the point where you scientifically, there's no way to deduce how it germinated. You might be able to track it back a few steps. And I'm talking to you, Rich. You might be able to track <laughs> it back a few steps. You stopped listening years but, ago. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But it's always going to get to that point where you can't ascertain how it originated. And that's the point of faith. And well, understanding. The, the and point I, and was, I don't mean faith just yeah. in terms of religion and God. I just yeah. mean in faith that it was a message for you. Right. And you're not going to be able to prove it because that's the whole point of it. It's unprovable. Happen, well, that's what I'm saying. What'll happen with that story is that you get to the radio station and uh, 
it'll be an unsatisfying answer for the rich types. <laughs> the rich will go, it'll talk to the disc jockey and he said like, yeah, I don't know. You know what? I had a free 30 minutes. You know, we usually we have a tape we play. We've got a, uh, you know, heavy rotation we got to do, but I had 30 minutes to play whatever I wanted. And I don't know, for some reason, Lawrence Will came into my mind and I, I dug through our stacks and we had one and I just played a track. I don't know why it seemed kind of fun and silly and it's fun music and hadn't heard it in a while. And there you go. And it's like, no, what did you have a vision? No, didn't really have a vision. Just thought of it. Yeah. Who spurred that? How did that happen? Who motivated that to disc jockey to play that at that time? You're not going to get a satisfying answer. That's, that's my, my point. Okay. That's my point too. Well, there you Look go. at that. We made the same uh, point. And so now that we've talked about the story of Mary and other Marys like her as the vanishing hitchhiker legend, the template that she is, that she fits into, she's not the only one, nor is she the only one in the United States. So let's take a look here, step back and see all the other ladies in white that are around the world. And vanishing hitchhikers. Well, because <laughs> here's the thing that we have the power to do, and this is something that you said to me earlier off the record, mm. but that Beardsley and Hanky couldn't do. They didn't exactly. have, we have the technology now. Not only can we share this story with more of the world, because we have listeners all over the world. Hey, everybody, special shout out to Glasgow. Well, I hope we get to your story. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to figure out on the fly here which ones to include and not. There's so many of them. Yes. We apologize in advance if we don't get to your particular country's story. Uh, yes. Because we got a lot of messages from white. people and, and the yeah. ark dug up a bunch of stuff, but it is fascinating. And so what Beardsley and Hanky couldn't do, we can do. We can take a look at where Mary lives, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And not only that, we can share that story with our listeners. So let's go. Exactly. Well, what we're trying to do here again is make these connections. So as you hear these Keep in mind the stuff that, yeah, it may have come up before, but there's a reason for it. And what is that reason? Keep that question in mind. So maybe we'll go, go south of the border down to Mexico, but you don't have to cross the border, actually, because this next woman in white is very popular, not only through the southern and southwest United States, going into Texas, all of Southern California. Well, anywhere there's Latin Hispanic, American culture, right? uh, Exactly. Yeah. But what I didn't realize, it, it's been traced sometimes all the way up to Montana Ooh. and the banks of the Yellowstone River. So uh, who is this lady? Well, we've gotten a lot of requests to cover her in the past. So hopefully we can do her a little justice now. And that's La Llorona, which translates roughly from Spanish into the wailing woman or the weeping woman. And she's probably Mexico's most famous and ubiquitous ghost lady. And here's what's interesting about uh, the contrast between her. Mary is well known in Chicago, especially on the south side. La Llorona is known throughout Mexico. All of, like a whole country knows her and claims her as their own. Yes. So who is she? Well, you can hear stories about her all throughout Mexico. But even, as I said, the United States. In central Texas, there's Woman Hollering Creek also known as Woman's Hollow Creek, also thought to have uh, been named after the Weeping Woman. And that's on the Interstate 10 between uh, Seguin, Texas, and San Antonio. If you go to Southern California and you ask anybody with a Latino background, I will bet $1,000 they've heard of her and have their own family stories because she is a very important figure to discuss Within the family, she's not just a, a passing ghost story. Well, in 2010, she even became a feature of the Universal Studios Park here and is in one of their scare zones and eventually earned her own maze in a haunted house called La Cazadora de Niños, the Hunter of Children, which Dude. tells you a little <laughs> bit more about her background. Well, here's what's different, okay? And so there are some similarities and differences, which I'd like to quickly point out here. The legend of La Llorona and sightings go back at least 500 years to the time of the conquistadors, at least. So one interesting thing is that some of the descriptions of her wouldn't fit that era, but that legend has come down that far in some form or another. And so every era, as we said before, it's like with Resurrection Mary, she's wearing disco shoes in one era. Yeah. And another, she's got a 30s ball gown. She fits whatever era it is and can be claimed by that decade. So this legend is very old, but there are some through lines about her that have lasted for that long. So what does she look like? Well, she's described as a beautiful, tall, young woman with long flowing black hair, usually wearing a white dress, sometimes in tatters and dirty, but it could be the gown she was buried in, much like the other ladies in white. Sometimes she's described as wearing a black dress, uh, sometimes with a veil. And what do the colors mean? As we said before... 
Well, they're symbolic. White could be uh, virginal and pure, which is part of her story, or angelic, or if it's tattered, something kind of sinister about it, like she was buried in it. If it's a black uh, cloak, well, that looks like death to me, especially with a scary veil that you don't want her to lift up. Yeah. Because you don't know what's underneath it. So colors matter. It's like the orchid or lavender dress of Mary Brigovi. It makes a difference. And again, with a long flowing hair, you usually don't see her. Well, she had a bun. <laughs> maybe if she was an older lady, you know, the old crone that sits on your chest, maybe that's the case. But here, again, there's beauty that makes a difference with this story. She's usually seen near water, standing close or hovering over a river or stream. So like Mary, which we made that connection earlier, it's like there's water all around the Chicago area. Yeah, uh, and by specifically, the the, specifically Archer running along parallel to the Des Plaines River and the i and Canal. Exactly. So that's the idea with La Llorona is that she travels these waterways. Water's a big connection. Why? Because that's part of her story. And there's usually two major versions here. And the big difference is that, yes, she's tragic, but she's also vengeful and sometimes despicable because the one element to all the versions of her story that you'll hear is that Either she was a young, beautiful woman that had children, but she loved to go to the dances and get the attention from the young men, kind of a single mom, but neglects her children that die or end up drowning by accident in the local river or creek, and she is distraught and wails for her children. Where are they? Where are they? Have you noticed that ever since the new millennium and that fateful year of 2012, the term Mayan calendar has been tossed around a lot, but really, most people don't know much or anything about it, and we shouldn't be ignorant of our buzzwords. Well, we still seem to be here. The world didn't end. And yes, that kind of bugs me to see misinformation being spread around, which is why the Great Courses Plus, with its over 9,000 lectures on a massive selection of topics, is such a great resource. And this latest series, Maya to Aztec, Ancient Mesoamerica Revealed is really helping to clear up some common misconceptions. Well, here's a few interesting things about the sacred Mesoamerican calendar most probably aren't aware of. It was comprised of 260 days and started as early as 600 BC. And then its use spread across all the cultures in the region, and it's still around today. A person's birthday defined their personality and their destiny. Well, sounds a little like astrology, right? Well, each day in the calendar had its own character and told you things you should and shouldn't do on that day. In Oaxaca, your birthday was actually your name. But everywhere in Mesoamerica, the calendar became the heart of daily life and symbolized its cyclical nature. Man, I cannot wait to dive in deeper on the astronomy, the mathematics, and the sacred geometry. All of the science and art on this is a really fascinating subject. Well, our listeners don't have to wait because we've arranged a special limited time offer. Yes, we have that kind of power. <laughs> where they can get a whole month of unlimited access to enjoy this or any one of their fantastic lectures for free. That's right. So the next time you casually discuss the Mayan calendar in the break room or at a party, you'll really know what you're talking about. And you can finally shut down that annoying know-it-all, which I've been working on since we start the show, didn't we? <laughs> oh, uh, but <boy>. anyway... <laughs> To get this special free month offer, you need to sign up through our special URL, which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Remember, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. I'm Elise, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. The other major story is that she was a beautiful young woman of a peasant class who marries an upper-class man, and they fall in love, have two children. However, as the years progress, he becomes disinterested. He's traveling a lot. He's not home a lot. And one day he comes home with a upper-class lady in the carriage with him. He says hello to his children, but ignores his wife, his more peasant, lower-class wife, and turns his attention towards the upper-class lady. This infuriates Maria again, Mary Maria, that name's the same, Mm -hmm. uh, because that's also reported as her original name before she's known as La Girona. Maria becomes so enraged at this slight that she throws her children in the river and then immediately snaps out of it or realizes she's done something wrong, jumps in or tries to rescue them, but it's too late. Mm. And then she either dies one of two ways, generally. She's either so distraught, she doesn't eat, she just wanders the bank looking for them, and she wastes away into a skeleton-like figure until she finally succumbs, or she jumps in herself and commits suicide. 
So basically, yes, starting off as a tragic figure, either through her own negligence, it becomes an accident, perhaps, or she intentionally throws in the children, but regrets it and uh, is forever condemned. And the part of the story is that she gets to heaven, she's not let in because she doesn't have her children with her. So she's condemned to wander the earth looking for them for eternity. Now, the difference between her and Mary is that you don't want to see her even as a lark. <laughs> no, with the people that have spoken to us about her, including uh, some people we had on the Black Eyed Kids episodes who ha- were uh, Hispanic, they indicated how frightening it was to see her. And that oh, they no. were yeah. instructed by their families, if you ever saw her at all costs, were to flee and get away. Yeah, because uh, seeing her or hearing her wail could spell death, because what does she want? She wants to replace her children. And she will take your children if she has to, or any children out after dark are liable to be snatched up because she needs kids <laughs> to replace her own. And so what does that tell you, though? That's also a device used by the parents to, like, you know, frighten the kids into good behavior. Because as Domino Rene Perez says in her book, quote, for people of Mexican ancestry, La Llorona traditionally serves as a cultural allegory, instructing people how to live and act with an established social mores. At times, however, she is simply a spooky bedtime story. Her tales are told to children to induce good behavior. When I was growing up, though, no one ever used a La Llorona or her story to make me behave. My parents, neighbors, and relatives used El Cucuy, uh, (laughs) La Llorona's male counterpart for that job. So basically, he's the boogeyman. So what she's saying here is that it's a useful tool. That's why the stories are told. But not just for that reason, is that it's a lesson to everybody. What is Mary's lesson? Well, don't walk home in the cold on a deserted road by yourself at night. There's a cautionary tale to a lot of these stories. And so that's a large part of La Llorona's legend is that it's a cautionary tale. It's a social instructor, but it's also a scary story. And that's why it keeps getting told. It's a campfire tale that sticks and has meaning. So anyway, that's what's different. And the the other fact is that, yes, she is vengeful where Mary is not. She's just tragic. And remains tragic. She doesn't want to harm anybody. There's no bad uh, predictions that are coming from her. She just eternally wants to keep going home. And if you give her your jacket, she'll even fold it up and put it (laughs) and leave it behind for you. Well, that's what's funny is that uh, that follows in a lot of stories, but not just with Mary, as we'll see here shortly. So then here's what's interesting, and it leads into our next story, is that part two prompted an email from one of our listeners, and his name is Frederick. And here's a version of the Lady in White story from his own country, the Dominican Republic. Now, I believe he lives in New York now, but basically he's writing to us because of how similar the Resurrection Mary story is to one from his own country in the Dominican Republic. There's a ghost called La Reina de las Americas, or the Queen of the Americas. That's the street where their story takes place. Right, that's their Archer Avenue. Exactly. He, so He said yeah. that America Avenue is one of the principal avenues of the eastern part of the city of Santo Domingo. That's why it's called that. Exactly. Think about that as their Archer Avenue. And their story is that a beautiful young woman and her newlywed husband, or uh, they were on their way to get married or on their honeymoon, get in a car wreck on this street on their way to the airport. So again, this is a more current version, or they're on their way somewhere after the honeymoon. That's the one thing that sticks. And the tragedy here is that she dies. Well, they both die. That's the tragedy, but right after they got married. So again, a white dress, wedding dress perhaps, that she's still wearing. It's unfulfilled. They never make it. Again, she's a beautiful young woman, and her handsome husband, they never make it. It's unfulfilled love. They don't get to where they're going. And now she can be seen on that avenue getting rides from people, trying to go home, trying to get to where she's going. So, of course, as men pick her up, and it it might be a little chilly out, she's only wearing the white dress, one account has them giving her their suit jacket because she's cold, and she's uh, shaking her head, no, no, no thanks. They say, no, no, it's okay to take the jacket, and he'll be back for it the next day. But when he returns... He's told that she's been dead a while, and a family member then takes him to the cemetery where he sees the jacket folded on the tombstone. There we go. And that's another folded jacket story from the Dominican Republic. So Quite a long ways from Chicago. Here's an interesting twist on this, though. Frederick describes himself as a bit of a skeptic, but he remembers one night his uncle coming home, one of his uncles, trembling, and he didn't speak for about an hour, and then he finally told... 
Frederick's mother that he gave a ride to a ghost. And how Frederick's uncle's experience was different is that, unlike these other stories, she didn't say a word. And the moment that he asked her where she was heading and what her name was, she disappeared. Now, this guy is described, uh, Frederick's uncle, as 6'3", 300 pounds of muscle, big, strong guy, but he remembers him shaking like a leaf. Yeah. So again, it's like a Chicago cop having seen everything being shaken to the core. Yeah. That's an example from the Dominican Republic, getting outside of the Americas here, and now we're heading east. So now we're going to take a look at countries around the world with their own ladies and white stories, also called the white lady. And that archetype, that characteristic seems most common, although they're not always dressed like that, but they have similar characteristics. So here are some uh, names. And again, there's way too many to mention, but here, here's just a sampling of some of the names around the world. Good luck to me. Here we go. No, no, that's why uh, I dumped it I'm on you. I'm ready for all the emails to come in from all over the world. No, no, this. just, well, just start with just Mary. Scott's Gaelic. Yeah, yeah, this is, by the way, this is from a blog that ARC member Katie Cohen found. The blog is called The Legend of the Woman in White by Krista Durante, and uh, it was recently updated on January 5th, 2017. And so here we're going to talk a little bit about these names from Durante's blog that are all different types of women in white or weeping women from all over the world. Mary, a ghost or spirit conjured to reveal the future. Banshee, a fairy woman who will wail when someone is about to die. Balban Sith, female vampire in Scottish mythology. Leannon Seed, I'm, no, I'm not saying that right. It's we're Celtic, gonna to, we're Celtic gonna, folklore. Yeah, we're going to uh, cut you off soon here, but keep going. That's a fairy <laughs> woman who takes a human lover. Holdra, yeah. Scandinavian. Siona, Venezuelan. Sukoyant, Dominican, Trinidadian, and Guadalupian folklore, witch vampire, Samodiva, woodland fairies found in the South Slavic folklore, Clodana, Irish, Aswang, Filipino, Pantianak, Indonesian, Manananggal, Filipino vampire, Rusalka, Slavic mythology again, Succubus, which is a female demon that seduces men, Moros and Cantadas, that's Portuguese, and Galician folklore, a female fairy, Weissfrauen, German, and Vitviven, Dutch mythology, elven beings known as wise women. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was just a lot of fun seeing the best you, you twist through that. Uh, <laughs> my apologies, sir. Yeah, you're, uh, you're but there not, are, sorry. these are folkloric terms and names. It's like, uh, case in point, like the banshee yes. in Irish mythology. She is a wailing woman, usually foretelling the death of a loved one or family member. Sometimes yourself, you don't want to hear her. You don't want to see her. That's not a good thing. So that's a lot like La Llorona, but that's different to adapt to Irish Celtic culture because she's sometimes seen with a gray cloak and red hair. Yes. Here are some ones that are more similar to Resurrection Mary. England has the ghost of Blue Bell Hill and also the White Lady of Willow Park. So they have their own kind of stories that are similar. The White Lady of the Old Mill Hotel in Scotland. Basically, then you start to get uh, just stories about beautiful women ghosts, but they all have these similar characteristics to these main stories. Take, for example, here, uh, the Rusalka. She's the ghost of a young woman or child who has died by drowning. Similar as before. Most Rusalkas were girls who committed suicide because they were betrayed by a lover. They haunt the river where they usually died. They sit by the side of the river in a tree, dance hypnotically in a water meadow, or sing beautifully on the riverbank but they are bitter, and their aim is to capture young men and drown them. And that is from Cox and Forbes, 2014. So again, that's pretty similar to La Llorona. The water, the vengefulness, possibly committing suicide, and also wanting to take people with them to join them in death. So again, folks, keep in mind, we're trying to make connections and draw patterns here, which is all we could do. As I, as I said, that's what we do with these strange things, to make some meaning out of them. I remember earlier I was talking about uh, sometimes they're centered around current events. Yeah. So what happened in 2011? You remember that because we talked about it quite a bit. Well, the tsunami in Japan. That's right. And here's what's interesting. We have a listener there. His name's Lewis Hurst. He's an English teacher. He has degrees in ethnology, specializing in traditional narrative. So he says he can be described as a folklorist. And he sent us an email regarding Resurrection Mary. He said, since you're still in the middle of the Resurrection Mary series, I wanted to share something that may be of interest to you both. A couple of years ago, there was a story doing the rounds in the media about taxi drivers in the part of northeastern Japan worst affected by the 2011 tsunami. Allegedly, 
More than one driver had picked up a passenger at a busy train station. This passenger had then given the driver the address of a house in a neighborhood which was completely swept away by the tidal wave and yet to be rebuilt. When the driver stopped at the requested address, he or she found the back seat empty. He goes on to say, as a folklorist, I'm mainly interested in the meanings and functions of such stories rather than their veracity. Vanishing hitchhiker stories seem to become attached to locales which have notable tragedies in their history or a sense of constant movement and change. What could be more redolent of movement, change, and the mutability of human life and circumstance than a road? As the Just a Story podcast pointed out on their Vanishing Hitchhiker episode, one of the central parts of the Vanishing Hitchhiker legend is the tragedy of never being able to go home again. So many of those lost to the tsunami were never found. So all the wow. best to Astonishing Legends, Lewis Hurst. That thank was a you. great email. Yes, yeah. thank you very much for sending that in. It's always wonderful to hear from people who are smarter and better educated than we are. <laughs> that was a perfectly written email as well. <laughs> Dramatically perfect with all the spelling. It was, I wasn't used to seeing that. No, and I'm going to have to pause for a minute and look up redolent. <laughs> okay. It's a new word for me. Well, that's a fun chore we can all do. Yes, indeed. Okay. Oh, strongly reminiscent or suggestive of. Yes, there you go. Same. Or an archaic form, fragrant or sweet smelling. Isn't that interesting? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, so thanks again, Mr. Hurst or Professor Hurst, however you may be addressed. I think one thing that this strikes a chord with with me just very quickly, Forrest, yeah. is um, the Northridge quake. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I remember about the Northridge earthquake, and when I'm talking about this, it was a major earthquake that hit California in, what was it, 1994? I was living and working in L.A. when this happened, and I remember stories after it of people saying in Los Angeles that on the freeways that they had suddenly found an angel in their car next to them warning them of a pending major earthquake. And I remember hearing these stories just at work. I don't know how they came to me, and I don't know how they were traveling around in L.A. The internet wasn't a, as big a deal then, for sure, as it is now. I also can't, unfortunately, remember if these stories were before or after the Northridge quake, which takes away some of their power. I feel like it was after and maybe people were just worrying about another earthquake because I seem to remember that lots of folks were saying that there were these angels and they were – drivers were encountering them as they drove on L.A.'s freeways and being warned of a pending earthquake that I seem to remember didn't come. Okay, so that goes back to the other uh, – The prophecy. Right, yeah. and uh, the – kind of the liminal being or the person who is not a supernatural being but has mystical powers like prophecy. Yes. And comes to warn people. By the way, if you're yeah. from Los Angeles and you're listening to this and you heard some of these stories, would you please email me because I'm fuzzy <laughs> on the details. Now he's fascinated. Well, yeah, yeah and this. I'd like to be more accurate about right. what I'm relaying. But, right. So yeah, if you heard any stories like that earthquake story or about the lady in white in Griffith Park, please let us know. Drop us an email at astonishingcontact at gmail.com. Anyway, so big tragedy, lots of misery, lots of people trying to get home. That's my rapper name. Yeah, misery, lots no, of misery. No, no, big tragedy. Oh, I see, because I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling some misery now. So back to the U.S. now, the headless bride of the Old Faithful Inn at Yellowstone National Park. Over the years, guests have sighted an apparition of a woman wearing a flowing white dress walking down the stairs from the crow's nest with her head under her arm. That little aspect there, that's disturbing. Well, it is, but I think also another thing to note is that you're not really headless if you have it with you. <laughs> it's not where it's supposed to yeah. be. No, it's yeah, not, but, you exactly. know. Exactly. But, but like, here's the thing, yes. Yeah, I would say out of place head. <laughs> right. I don't know. But she's wearing the white dress, probably a bride, yeah. and uh, somehow got separated from her head, which means the wedding's probably off or delayed. Yeah, uh, definitely delayed. So a, a, a tragic figure. Oh, here's one. Scott, have you ever heard of Lydia the Phantom Hitchhiker? Boy, have I. I'll bet. In fact, I think I've probably mentioned her in a prior episode. Lydia comes from my second home state, and I say that because mm. even though I was born in California, I was only there till I was two. And then I lived in Colorado, and then I lived in North Carolina, which is where I really came of age, as it were. And one of the things that I remember about growing up in North Carolina was the story of Lydia, who was a phantom hitchhiker. She's on a stretch of uh, US 70 in a little town called Jamestown, which is right between Greensboro, North Carolina, and High Point, North Carolina. And this bridge, there's an old road that ran under it. And supposedly at this bridge, a girl was on her way to a dance and she died in a car wreck in 1923. And when other people would be driving under this bridge or through the area, Lydia's Bridge, they would see her and stop to pick her up. And then they would take her home to take her to this house. 
They look back in the car. She's not there. They go up to the front door. The woman at the door says, Lydia's been dead for years. You're not the first, and you won't be the last to bring her home. That's right. I grew up with this story. I remember hearing it even before I lived in the Greensboro area, which I didn't live there until college. I lived in Raleigh about an hour, a little over an hour away most of the time, but I heard that story even there. All the details are similar. There was a story of a, a photo, just like the Jerry Pala story, a photo of her being in the foyer of the house or right behind the woman answering the door, all this kind of stuff. And this was fascinating about this. There was a couple of things. One is my wife and I now have a condominium in the area to uh, be closer to family uh, because all our family's there. It's less than a mile from this bridge. And, oh, the, and uh, I drive by it all the time, but they moved the road. The road needed to be widened. The bridge is for a train track. So they had to move the road over to make a wider bridge. So the old bridge, Lydia's bridge, is now when you drive by, it's about 100 feet from where the main road is, and it's all overgrown and super creepy looking. I also went there in college, and all kinds of crazy satanic stuff was spray painted in the oh, that's graffiti. Fun. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't stay long. No, that's <laughs> nice. But I do hope you pick her up one day, just ah. so we could, uh, you know, I want you to have a better paranormal story to talk about here on the air. Well, I yeah. had a pretty good one. That's much better than mine. I have nothing, really, but I, I want a juicy one that well, we can regale Well, here's the, the thing for with. Lydia. The road's not there anymore, so uh, she's standing over there. She's standing in the bushes. Nobody can see her. She's <laughs> well, going to be standing there a long time. Hey, she has the ability to get a ride, so you don't know where she's going to end up. But that's interesting because it's a location, again, by the road. There's the dance element. Yeah. Uh, That's the way I heard it anyway. Yeah, no, no. And it was a story I read in a North Carolina book when I was a kid, and it was called The Lonely Apparition. Right. Died in a auto accident. You go back to the house, and that's my daughter that uh, died, uh, you know, on the anniversary of her death, whatever. And local journalists think they figured out who she was, by the way. They found a a girl that fits the profile, and uh, her name is not Lydia, but it fits the profile for the car accident and all the other stuff. So they actually think, unlike us with Resurrection Mary, that they figured out who Lydia was. And there's a relative of that girl who is alive and was actually interviewed by a local TV station. Well, there you go. I mean, it's interesting. It doesn't, I mean, it'd be hard to prove you'd, uh, if you got a photo of her and it matched that, that'd be creepy. It kind of like if we had a photo of an apparition of uh, Anna Norcus and then it matches the one on the newspaper, that would give me chills. Yeah. But let's move on to Highway 365 near Woodson, Arkansas. Same kind of thing. There's a phantom woman, a young woman usually wearing a white dress who asked to be taken somewhere. The driver picks her up, usually on a rainy night, and has them driving her to a house in Redfield. You get out of the car to walk around, and she's disappeared. You go to the house later on, and then you're told by usually a parent there at the house that the daughter has been killed on that night four years ago. And on each anniversary of her death, she finds someone to drive her home. Oh, there you go. Now, here's one that I'd not heard of before, generally titled Lavender and the Kissing Tree. Now, this came to us from a new listener named Brett, and it's about a local Salt Lake City story that has a lot of the same elements that we've been describing. But this one talks about Marilyn Watson. So we actually, in this case, we have a name associated with this story because this is the pioneer days in 1847 she came out with her scottish family that converted to mormonism and as the story goes this also involves a dance she loved to dance she loved to wear this dress that was lavender colored and she acquired that nickname and she didn't mind because uh, she loved the color she loved the dress however she was also to meet with tragedy but not from a car accident she caught pneumonia and died a year and a half later after moving there into the valley at the age of 20 now a few years later there is another family name which is interesting because we have the tanner family and a uh, young henry tanner used to like to go to the dances and there's even an address where they would meet up under this tree they called the kissing tree which is now 600 East in Salt Lake City, he would like to meet the young gals at the dance, and he meets one, and they stop by the kissing tree on a cold night, and he offers her his jacket. They share a kiss, but it starts to rain, so he takes her home. The home is dark. There's nobody else around. She goes inside, thanks him. She keeps the jacket. He comes back to pick it up, and somehow the house looks different. I I love these elements because it's the the element in the... uh, You know, the horror movie, The Ghost Story, where the house looks different. Wow, it looks really overgrown. Yeah. The weeds have sprung up. What's going on here? No one's in the house. It's been abandoned. He goes to the neighbor's house, and he said, uh, yeah, you can find Miss Lavender under the poplar tree at the far east end of the cemetery. And when he goes there, that's where he finds his jacket neatly folded over Marilyn's headstone. 
you can't really find a burial record for Marilyn Watson, but I find it interesting that there is a name, a full name to go with this. It's and also Mary. There you and go. Short, it's a short version of it. It's, it's a version yeah. of that. And again, it's so nice that they're folding these jackets. Yeah. <laughs> you're getting it back. But that is, again, that's what we said. That well, you know why of, you're getting it back. Yeah, what, from, from the uh, heavens it. cleaners? Well, no, you can't take it with you. If you're ah. a spectral being, you right. got to leave it somewhere. You're leaving it where he's going to go look because it's your own headstone. Yeah. But the fact that it's not just <laughs> draped like it's over a chair. It's nicely folded. So as we come to wrap up the episode here, there is one big question that's kind of outstanding. We may never answer, but from what we've heard, what is Resurrection Mary? Is she what's called a tulpa? Is she a thought form that so many people know her story, like all these other stories around the world, that she is created, that some version of her is now created to fulfill the elements of this folktale story, that she's forever wandering, that she's wearing a white dress, that she's beautiful with long blonde hair, always going to the dance, always getting a ride home, always going to the cemetery. Is that just the parts of the legend that is actually creating a real thought form that turns out to be an apparition? Or is it something like an egregore? We talked about her in the Bell Witch episode. Yes. To describe it, an occult concept representing a thought form or collective group mind, an autonomous psychic entity made up of and influencing the thoughts of a group of people. The symbiotic relationship between an egregore and its group has been compared to the more recent non-occult concepts of the corporation as a legal entity. So that's an explanation from Wikipedia. But what's happening here is that if you want to apply it that way, it's like, well, the legend of Mary has taken on a life of its own. And as we said before, maybe it's in your subconscious that maybe you've heard it before, you weren't aware of it, but somehow you're bound to see her. We're not saying that's it. That's just a theory that's out there. This is happening all over the world. The stories are the same. So once you've asked the question of what Mary could be, you're basing all that on her characteristics. And here's an interesting story, which I've heard now for a number of years, I know six, seven years, from a friend of mine who I've known for over 20 years. And I trust him implicitly. He's a stand-up guy. And uh, when I first heard this, I kept it in the back of my mind because I thought like, man, one of these days, if I ever have a podcast, I don't even know what that is yet, but one day if we do, my good friend Scott and I, we, we get one together, this has got to fit somewhere. And then I just thought maybe it's here because it's got all the elements of what we've just been talking about with Resurrection Mary and all these stories of the vanishing hitchhiker, except there's a twist. All right, so we have the pleasure of being here with my friend Todd, who I've known since, I'm guessing, 1995 or 1996. That's about right. <laughs> and we first met each other, I think, through work, and we are probably both freelancers. No, I was staff at that time. You were a producer freelancer. I was a freelancer production assistant, actually. Right, right. We were working on uh, corporate events and corporate media, uh, a lot of different accounts, mostly automotive stuff, I think. A lot of videos, yeah, training videos and... Exactly. Auto show videos. Right. So like anyone you do, like you start talking with somebody, you immediately hit it off. Hey, we're kind of interested in the same things. He's really well read, very well studied and in, in all kinds of weird esoteric stuff, which of course I was fascinating. And just, he's just been a close, great friend ever since. I'm, I'm very close with their family. I can't remember the first time you told this story, It maybe six or seven years ago. Probably at least. Yeah. It wasn't... Probably that, comes up every few years. <laughs> comes up every few years, but it's not one you lead off with when you just meet somebody. And at that point, I'd already known you for at least a decade, maybe. And so I was like, what? what? And Because it's mind-blowing. And the reason it's very apropos to our series here on The Vanishing Hitchhiker is that it is that story. And another thing you hear about urban legends in general, people always say like, well, you never hear from the person that it happened to. It was always the friend of the friend, or there's some distance to that which is true, and that's the way that these stories are set up, and that's part of the fun. You'll never hear from the original person, but here we are going to hear from the original experiencer. And, we, we like yeah. to find those people whenever we can. Well, I, <laughs> because... It's Under not, a rock or crazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Todd, as I always say on the show, it's like if you haven't heard firsthand of a story that's amazing and maybe spiritual or paranormal, it's, you haven't asked enough people. But I love the twist on this because it is the vanishing hitchhiker, but this time Todd was the hitchhiker. 
So Todd, why and don't you he set clearly story? didn't vanish because he's, <laughs> he's still he's here. Like, I'm looking right at well, him. Well, we don't yeah. know. Maybe <laughs> when we're not there, he is gone. Right. But, although I, I'm very close friends with his wife too, but uh, she would not allow that. She's <laughs> right. Like, Sometimes I think she doesn't know I'm there. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, why don't you set up the story? What year was this? Probably spring of '76. Okay. You were in college. I was in college in Portland, Oregon. A group of six of us were planning to take an extended weekend up to the coast of the Olympic Peninsula up in Washington. And um, the six of us broke into groups of two. Two groups hitchhiked up, and then one uh, group of two drove a car up with all our supplies and everything. Not to weigh us down while we're hitchhiking. Right. Yeah, so we left one Friday morning, planning to come back on a Monday morning. And the journey began, basically. Was there a destination spot? We were headed to basically part of an Indian reservation up on the Olympic Peninsula around Forks and La Push. Mm-hmm. Kind of made famous by those vampire movies a couple of years That's back. That's right. Yeah, yes. That whole area. So Twilight series. Yes. And so th- there's a lot going on in that area to begin with. Right. I don't know if there's any vortexes or not. <laughs> <laughs> One might think. So we were headed there, a really beautiful segment of the Washington coastline, very rocky, a lot of great hiking. And we went up there to uh, just basically, in a sense, chill, but also sort of practice some stuff we've been playing with, you know, in regards to some books by Carlos Castaneda at the time, right, right. the teachings of Don Juan and a Yaki way of knowledge and those sort of things. So, so, so the trip already is starting with kind of a, maybe a spiritual tone on it, an enlightenment kind of a, uh, a See tone what we could find. Yeah, you know. exactly. You start off on this trip. How far are you into the trip and who are you with? Uh, so we got a ride right out of Portland. Oregon, uh, my friend Mikey and I, they took us up to Centralia, Washington, right. which is straight up I-5, maybe about a third of the way up Washington State. And we were dropped off there, and uh, Mikey and I crossed the freeway and started to hitchhike heading west towards the coast. Mm-hmm. At the time, in Centralia, Washington, there's a home for juvenile delinquents. Right. And so on the day we happened to be hitchhiking, two juvenile delinquents <laughs> went missing from the uh, facility in Centralia. So we had been walking maybe 10 minutes, you know, and no ride came by. And then all of a sudden we see a Washington State police car come racing at us with his lights on. And he pulls over right behind us and, you know, asks us for our ID and everything. And we were like, God, this is awfully early to be getting hit up by the cops. (laughs) But he had told us what had occurred in the uh, facility in Centralia, you know, checked our ID. We were cool. And he ended up giving us a ride. So he took us for about 45 minutes straight out towards the ocean before we would basically have to make a right turn and head north towards La Push and Forks. Then he turned around and sped right back towards I-5. That was nice of him. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was, so it started out strange to begin with, you know, yeah. but it was actually quite fun because the guy probably drove over 80 the whole way on a <laughs> two-lane road. Yeah, yeah. Thought nothing of it, and we were white-knuckled the whole time which was not the only time we were white-knuckled on this hitchhiking experience, but (laughs) we were let off there. He turned around right at the intersection, and I forget what freeway it is, or freeway's wrong, a two-lane highway headed north towards La Push and Forks, and we kind of hung out there. We ate some, you know, little lunch we had with us and waited for our next ride, which turned out to be, you know, this guy, I think some sort of salesman. It maybe took us... 15 miles farther, you know, it didn't really progress us too much, but it was another ride. But then it set up the ride that we're here to talk about. So he let us off, and it was in this little sort of roadside attraction, you know, gas station mm-hmm. and stuff. And we were there, and then we walked out of there and started hitchhiking north again when a, you know, this is 76, I said, so kind of a late model American car pulls over to pick us up, and it was an elderly couple. Nothing really uh, abnormal about him. Just looked very friendly, nice. You, well, you guys had your thumbs out? Were you? Oh, yeah, it was the traditional hitchhiking thumbs out. It was <laughs> right. legal in Washington, you know, and back then everybody hitchhiked as opposed That's to right. now. It I seems. remember that from when yeah. I was younger. I was, it was just my mom was like, you can never do this. <laughs> well, was, it, it was yeah. kind of like Uber before Uber in a weird <laughs> yeah. sense, I think. But, it was analog. Uber. Yeah. yeah, you know, it was a great way to meet people you know, yeah. and That's talk. True. You know, you don't always have control of who you're meeting. Right, but right. 
that's the one downside there. Yeah. Eileen Warnos kind of, you know. <laughs> well, it goes both ways. You know, it's kind of yin true. and yang. There is the upsides, and then there's some serious downsides. Sure, sure, sure. Knock on wood, I've been lucky <laughs> and haven't hitchhiked for over 40 years now. But Well, good to hear. And kids out there, yeah, that's not a good idea now. So uh, this elderly couple picked us up, and we hopped in the back seat. And, you know, we're driving for five minutes, and they were pleasant, you know, went through introducing ourselves to each other. And then it was kind of quiet for, I'd say, I don't know, five or ten minutes, but it could have been shorter knowing how time tends yeah. to stretch in quiet periods. And then out of the blue, but nothing drastic, the elderly woman in the passenger seat turns around and begins to stare back and forth at Mikey and I, and we're like, oh, okay. Well. <laughs> oh, this is weird. <laughs> and, and then she focuses on my friend Mikey and um, looking at him very intently, like yeah. she's trying to discern something. And just... I guess not out of the blue, but just off the top of her head, she looks at Mike and says, you tried to buy a car last week. And, you know, we were taken aback. And, of course, Mikey was looking at buying a car the week before, some old army green Fiat of some sort, but didn't purchase it. But, you know, he was dwelling on it because, as she put it, it left an impression on his mind that she was picking up. And we were kind of surprised by this sort of line of conversation we're having, you know, and then she went on to say a few other things that had been playing on Mike's mind in the prior weeks. You know, we had some yeah. exams coming up at college, all that stuff, but, you know, nothing any intuitive person couldn't sort of come up with on their own. But she proceeded to tell us what their whole trip was and what she was picking up from Mike. She looked at me and basically said, you know, I was too complex to have a quick <laughs> sort of read on. Right, right. So she focused it back on Mike, who yeah. was more of an open book, I guess, because I've been called a lot of things. And, you know, being outgoing is not one of them. But, right. But so she tells us that her, she and her husbands are, for lack of a better word, disciples of Edgar Casey, and asks us if we know who Edgar Casey is. And at that point, I had heard of him, you know, just with what I was into at the time, but really didn't know much about him. And so she proceeded to tell us, you know, about Edgar Casey and his life and all that. And Sort of the more she talked about Edgar Casey, it was like I got where she was going and I understood a lot what she was saying. And then after the fact, looking at Edgar Casey, there was a lot of things about his whole life and his thing that I didn't necessarily buy or it didn't really attract me so much other than sort of some of the general things. But they were very intense on us, you know, or she was as the old man drove. Eyes on the wheel, huh? She started writing down their names and their address in Portland, Oregon. And we said, oh, yeah, we're coming from Portland. And then she wrote down some books to read, you know, about Edgar Cayce, you know, if we were interested. And then definitely, you know, if we had read some stuff and we wanted to talk further, to look them up back in Portland. And we said, great, we're driving some more. And quiet fell on the car again. And then pretty much out of the blue at this point, it's like, oh, we have to let you off now. And I was like, oh, okay, great. But we're kind of looking, and we're on a straight-as-an-arrow, two-lane highway. Huge corridor of pine trees on each side. No apparent sign of any kind of commercial establishment, houses, or anything for that matter. And they pull over and, you know, say it was nice to meet you and, you know, be sure to look us up back in Portland. And we got out of the car, you know, grabbed our backpacks and stuff, and threw them on the ground, kind of waved, and then turned to pick up our backpacks. We hear the tires hitting the gravel back on the asphalt, grab our bags, turn back around, and there's no car inside. And the lapse time, I would say, would be maybe five seconds, maximum 10 seconds, if that. But the idea is like, oh, this is strange. In that time, where would they go? Why would, you know? So we're sitting there, it's kind of strange, trying to figure out what happened, but we also had to get to a place before dark. And before we knew it, another car pulls up, and it's two Indians, or Native Americans, headed back to the reservation for the night. And they pick us up, and we get in the car with them, and then we realize, oh, this might not have been a good idea, because it was apparent that they were very drunk. They had a 12-pack sitting between them in the front seat, But very nice because they proceeded to pull over at the very next stop, which was maybe 10 miles up the road, and they bought Mike and I a 12-pack of beer, so (laughs) they weren't drinking on their own in the front seat. The 70s. Yes, (laughs) yes. And, you know, so 
we went on that way. And luckily, after a beer or two, I became less white knuckled with their driving. Right. And they actually took us all the way to the roads end to where we were going in La Push. Yeah. And we met up with our friends who were waiting for us in the parking lot. But wow. that was sort of the length of that trip right there from point A to point B. We always try to be respectful of our guests and their stories. And if there's anything funny about them, we're laughing with them and not at them. That is true. Uh, we all do dumb things from time to time. But if someone's done something dumb while committing a crime, well, then it's fun to laugh at them. That's what the podcast Dumb People Town is all about. Every week, this show celebrates and revels in dumb people around the world doing the dumbest things you can imagine. And plenty of things even the imagination can't create. You really can't make this stuff up. Uh, these true stories are so outrageous, no one would believe you if you did. It's a little like the Darwin Awards for criminal behavior. Behavior. <laughs> Dumb People Town is hosted by longtime professional comedy duo Jason and Randy Sklar, along with comedian Daniel Van Kirk. And these guys riffing on unbelievable real news stories of dumb crimes is some of the funniest stuff I've heard in a long time. You really feel their genuine awe for the stupidity inside each of us. Oh, there's stories about burglars uh, boarding spaceships, the door to door meat salesman. It really boggles the mind. And they get some of the funniest names in comedy on as guests like Maria Bamford and Tig Notaro, Keegan-Michael Key, and actors like John Hamm and Silicon Valley's Thomas Middleditch. Trust us, you don't want to miss a single dumb moment. Subscribe to Dumb People Town on iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Joe Harmon, and when I need inspiration for drone creepy monsters, I listen to Astonishing Legends. Now back to the show. Well, there you go, folks. That's a vanishing hitchhiker story, but the car vanished this time. What I love about the story, it's the flop. Are you aware of the vanishing hitchhiker I kind am. of motif? Yeah, yeah, the urban legend. So generally that's the part where you pick somebody up and they disappear. A lot easier to accomplish. Rather than getting into a car where the whole car vanishes, it also leads me to my next point about this, and that you were riding in some kind of... Uh, Ghost car. I won't say ghost car, but there's something because it, it was, of course, it all felt very real, like anything else. Right. Just oddly, though, it vanishes. I think the first thing that people will think about is like, well, okay, so it was much longer than you thought, then maybe it was five minutes. And by that time, they went over the rise and you couldn't see them anymore, or they turned off onto another road in the forest. But to be clear, this is one of those roads through like a national forest where there's no roads going anywhere. T-boning or at an intersection on the main highway through the trees. No intersections, no rises, you yeah. know, no swells in the road or anything. No, it was straight shot, straight arrow for as, as far as you could see, basically. It was the typical vanishing point shot yeah. Yeah. on a two-lane road. Again, the time frame. So you get the packs out of the cars. You both climb out. You're saying your goodbyes and you're just like fixing your gear again, right? Strapping, uh, tightening the straps. And as you said, it's probably five, maybe 10 seconds after they pull away. And after hearing the tires on the yeah. gravel hitting the road. Because yeah. you were off, it was the side of the road where they let you The out. shoulder. Right. They pulled over on There's the shoulder. There's a little gravel there. Yeah. Okay. We, we threw our bags out. We said goodbye. We got out. I turned to pick up my bag, heard the sound of the car hitting the freeway again, had my backpack in hand, turned to look. And there was nothing. And and then Mike, I would say a second or two after me, because I was kind of speechless at that point, <laughs> he turns and started sort of stuttering, mumbling, and saying, where are they? You know, And yeah. so that kind of set off that. But we were left with the little piece of spiral notepad that they had written us with their first names and books to read regarding Edgar Casey. Wow. Interesting. And an address in Portland, Oregon. Okay, so immediately following up with that, was it your sister-in-law that actually looked up that address, or did you guys actually go to the address first? We uh, tried to do a drive-by when we were back in Portland. Yeah. And uh, never found the address, but found where the address would be on that <laughs> block. And there was, it was interesting. So the address wasn't there, but in the address that was the one next to it. Yeah. was just what was left of the property was just a foundation. Huh. But that was it. Years later, my sister-in-law got interested in the story, and I had given her that piece of paper, and she was going to research it, but I don't know if she ever got that far enough. And this was many years later, right. where this couple would have been you know, years 
passed. Yeah. Well, I would think. Do you still have the paper? Does she have it? Or never got it back from her. Do you have the address? No. Do you have any idea what it was? I don't. It's, Other it's than it was now. in southeast Portland, uh-huh. on yeah. the other side of the Willamette River. I was only asking because we have you know a group of people who will dig down on stuff like yeah. that. If you happen to come back across it, but it's gone forever, is what you're saying. <laughs> Maybe under hypnosis. <laughs> well, since then, in the years that have passed, she is no longer my sister-in-law. Mm. Yeah. I would be surprised. Right. But, yeah, no, and I wish I do. Because, you know, it seems like every few years, you know, something happens where I circle back to this whole story. Sure. Or we talk to one of our group of friends, you know, and it's like, oh, do you remember, you know? So. Well, here's what's going to happen on our show. People are going to hear this, and we're going to start hearing from people with similar stories, and we'll connect you with them if you want to know. <laughs> because the interesting thing about our show is people will come on and tell a story like this, and all these people that have them that haven't either told their friends or haven't will suddenly be like, well, you know what? That happened to me, and I haven't told anybody. So maybe we'll hear from some people. Here's my question for you. What was Mikey, what's his experience with this? Was it different from yours, or...? Well, the experience was the same. Right. You know, having talked about it once we got out to where we were headed, because that was the first thing we started talking to our friends about. And when we, you know, hitchhiked back to Portland and for several months after that. But therein lies where Mike and I are different people. And my sensibilities are such where I tend to gravitate towards this kind of thing. Sure. And Mike's is, he became a doctor and he, he's more, I don't know how you'd say it, um... Scientific, uh, scientifically yes. grounded. Right, he's yeah. maybe he's trying to explain it away a little bit as he looks back on it. <sighs> to me, it was another experience that gets cataloged, and it definitely helped form who I am today. Yeah, I don't think Mike looked at it that way, sort of, or he moved past it onto other things because he was more career driven than I was. Okay, one hitch against me, I guess, is I've never been totally career oriented. It's more experience oriented. Sure. And I grew up that way with the way my family continually moved around the country, people I met, you know, experience I've had. So I basically have tried to continue that throughout my life. Yeah. And, and also seeing something like that, for me, it affirms my point, my way of looking at something where other people, I think, that's outside their realm of what they consider normal. So they'll put it aside, whether they're embarrassed to bring it up. Sure. Right? Or they don't want to be thought of as crazy or whatever. You said Mikey was kind of mumbling and stumbling, like, what is that? So what did he... Well, he was, you know, he was rattled that this woman was basically, as, you know, he later thought of it, was in his head, Ah. sensing things that were weighing heavily on his mind for the prior probably two weeks, you know, whether it was female problems, you know, looking at buying a car and just his workload at school. Right. And to me, that was, you could see he was a little rattled by that. Yeah, sure. And as an observer, I was totally intrigued. But it wasn't my head they were in at that point. So. <laughs> That's true. It kind of leads me to my next point. She was analyzing the both of you, and she said some interesting things like, well, I know that you boys are on a kind of a spiritual journey, so just be careful, I, well, she, like with a partying or something. Yeah, well, no, I think she had mentioned that she sensed that we were on a journey. Yeah. But then she would qualify that saying by every life is a journey, you know, sure. but that, you know, this weekend was going to be a big part of it. Yeah. And that was probably the biggest part right there. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, she sent something. She felt that way, you know, and she felt open enough to start telling us about Edgar Casey because I don't think Edgar Casey would ever be considered mainstream, you know, yeah. as far as bending spoons or if that might have been Geller. Well, that was Geller, but yeah, <laughs> but still. No, the he sleeping was, prophet. Yeah, he didn't but, do the yeah, talk show yeah, sleeping circuit. prophet. Correct. Yes, yeah. yeah. Did you tell your other friends, the other six people that were uh, – were on the trip about this. Yes. What did they say? It's interesting. We had six people. I'd say it was 50-50 as far as sensibilities relating to the experience Mike and I had. At least two of the others is like, great, you know, let's drink. Yeah, right. um, this other guy, uh, I won't mention his name, but he was more interested and started to pepper us with questions sure. because all that did for him was open up something intriguing and he wanted to know about that. Right. Right. Speaking of that and the journey and everything, on this day, when you got picked up by this car, were you under the influence of anything? No, not okay. at that time. 
Okay. Not to say that that wasn't our intent once we <laughs> reached <laughs> our destination. <laughs> right, right, right. But no, I that, know listeners will be wondering. So we, that's yeah. why we had a backup car. Yeah, right. well, right. we it was the late seventies that was kind of happening a lot. And but, as the way our rides turned out, it was a good thing because of the Washington State Trooper who. We oh had. yeah. <laughs> right. So you started out with the cop, then you had the salesman. Yeah, just right. a forgettable ride. Yeah. Then you had the ghost car. Followed by Native Americans who bought you a 12-pack. Correct. This is why you take a trip right here. And it, 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 was, it was a 12-pack of Rainier beer, too. Yeah. So, they, so they had us at the Rainier beer. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Wow. It's an amazing journey in every way. What I'm thrilled to hear is I feel like Forrest sometimes tells me these stories will be a friend of his. And I mean, he's embellishing. You know, we'll get down here and you're going to come really? in here and sit down and uh, be yeah. like, oh, no, I saw it drive away. I'm thrilled with how much this sticks to what Forrest has been telling me all these years. Well, that's, well no. <laughs> And, and I'm one who believes that time has a way of playing with memory. Sure, of course. Sure. And occurrences and experiences. So I'm well aware of, we all take creative license, I think, to a degree. But, yeah. well, from what Forrest says, and just knowing this is one story that hasn't gone anywhere, there's nowhere for me to sort of take that story. Yeah, anymore. right. Part of me, looking back at it, wishes I did a little more due diligence into finding the address and tracking that down. Well, anything happened on the trip back? Not really, other than the fact yeah. that we got very lucky. We had one ride take us all the way back to Portland, Oregon, mm. with another traveling salesman who popped Mentos candies <laughs> religiously the yeah. whole way down. Wow. I mean, he must have gone through, <laughs> you know, a 12-pack of those Well, at least things. his breath was fresh. <laughs> yeah. It, it sort of gave Mike and I a chance, again, to just sort of sit on our own and sort yeah. of we discussed what happened on the way up. You did. Because the way home was totally uneventful. Right. And it was always sort of the downer having to go back knowing that classes were the following morning. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So. Did you and Mikey talk about it much from that point of the incident onward? Or did you just say, Let, let's just put this to the side for the moment? I, I talked about it quite a bit. Yeah. In fact, probably for the following six to eight months, probably all the time, because it was, again, some different things were happened to me at during this point in my life that all seemed to relate. They were all different, but they all seemed to relate to the same thing. Right. And how I looked at it is basically shaping my worldview, you know, yeah. my spiritual view, my worldview, and well, all that. Well, that leads to a good question here as we kind of get towards the end. Who do you think these people were? What do you think that was? Because, I mean, I mean, we joke and say ghost car, but I, of course, I don't believe that the car was any kind of a specter or, you know, an imagined thing. I think it was solid, but yeah. that it went somewhere. And, and that's the one thing I would say after all these years and discussing it a number of times that that never concerned me. That yeah. was not what made it interesting. Most of the people who heard the story, that's what they wanted to know. That's what they, in my opinion, would get hung up on. The car. What happened to the car. Right. For me, it's like, I didn't care what happened to the car. I had an experience, and how does that relate to me, what I'm going through, and where it's going to take me? Yeah. So in that sense, that ride has been with me ever since, as strong as it was that day, because it has shaped who I am and how I perceive the world, which is... Anything can happen. I don't think I'll ever be able to explain most of the things that I've experienced, why they would happen. And I'm fortunate to have the experience, though, because I really think I'm richer for that. Yeah. Well, to me, it's like, I think it was in like Kingdom of Heaven, where you swear an oath and then I'll slap you in the face so you remember it. It's just words or just an event, but them disappearing, the car disappearing, is the slap in the face of like, pay attention, what you just experienced might be important to you later. We're also putting it in the wrong cubby hole, though. That's what's happening here. He put it in the right cubby hole. Yeah. I put it in the wrong. You were putting it. We can't, we shouldn't be talking about the car. <laughs> we're well, closed minded. No, no. <laughs> the idea, though, you know what I'm saying? That's, if you had taken the ride, it's like the stuff, you don't remember what the Mentos guy said to you, and you the salesman, and you probably don't remember what the first traveling salesman said to you. But you remember more what the couple had said, because look, if they're conscious of this, if they're some kind of like, if they had powers of some kind, a normal human couple that uh, were, were studied and they had the ability to maybe not disappear, but maybe in your mind, like you said, you, seeing with the brain, they shut off their image of them in your minds and the car was going on about itself, or they've actually physically went into another place Either way, it was punctuation on the story that made you remember it from that time on. It was the exclamation point. <laughs> right. Just at least to let me know that something very interesting 
abnormal yeah. in a daily sense or as an accepted sense happened. Right. And that it's also the way you, you're left feeling. You yeah. know, it's, it's <laughs> like anything big, you know, you don't, unless you bury it, you know, right. you just can't walk away from it and not be affected. Well, fascinating stories. I always love hearing them. And yeah. uh, you've, <laughs> you've, you've led a very interesting life <laughs> all the way up to this point. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, I, thanks I, for coming I, in. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening to me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. I think it's an interesting spin on this because, again, it's like it's hearing it firsthand and somebody who was there but on the opposite end of that. So thanks, thanks very much, Todd. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's quite a story. <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty it amazing. Is. I mean, he, he rode in a car. That's a physical machination. That's a machine <laughs> with people <laughs> yeah. in it that took Ex- him down the road. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. That's what's mind-blowing. And here's a couple of points. First of all, I can see a situation where, okay, like with Adam Selzer's ride-sharing vanishing Pedro story. Yes. Uh, Rose Hill Napoleon, Pedro. Rose Hill Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite. Uh where you thought you saw somebody get in. I mean, sometimes that happens, you know, and I, I know it's it's probably not a ghost. It's like you see something out of the corner of your eye, a shadow perhaps, and it's like, well, it may have been a bird over a skylight. There's probably an explanation. I didn't get a personal creepy feeling from it. It was just like, no, oh, there's a shadow. I thought I saw something move, you know, and, and who knows what it was. Seeing what Adam saw, a real whole person that he could describe and get an impression of as being this character from a cult movie that's a pretty good look. Yeah. And the fact that his other passenger didn't see it, that's an interesting scenario. But I can understand that maybe you were mistaken, you were tired, who knows? People can put forward all kinds of rational explanations for that. This is different because you and your friend didn't get into a car you just thought was there. Yeah. You got into something that took you down the road that you both witnessed and experienced. And got asked about Edgar Casey. <laughs> and got asked about Edgar Casey. Now, I, I got to be honest, folks, when we were thinking about doing this interview, Scott, you know, he was, of course, on board. But recently, we were kind of debating, what are the elements of the story? Why is it worthwhile to Resurrection Mary? I love the story, and I love sure. talking to Todd. Sure. It's super interesting. I wasn't sure why you wanted to connect it with Resurrection <laughs> Mary. To me... Yeah. It's just an opposites day story. It's <laughs> like, it's not a hitchhiker that vanishes, right. the car vanishes. And then it's like, that's the end of the connection. Okay. Although, yeah. you have made the point about, one of the points at least, about the address, the weird address and the fact that they went there later and nothing was there. Right. And that's definitely a good tying point. What I was able to uh, point out here with this story, it's like, yes, of course, the bizarro day, this time it wasn't the hitchhiker that vanished. It was the car. Yeah. Okay. I know that's a switcheroo and you're like, well, all right, that doesn't have anything to do with Mary. It's like, yes, I know it's opposite, but, but that's pretty amazing for a twist because look at all the other elements. The people got switched around or the parts in this story got switched around. So what do you have? You have the elderly couple that seems to be wise and can read minds. That's true. That gives you an address that you check out later that does not exist, that weeds are growing up over. It's on a road. They come to pick you up. It seems like a regular car. Everything's about it normal, except that it vanishes. And so it has a lot of the elements of the vanishing hitchhiker, I think, just switched around. So I thought that that was relevant and has some worth to it as a story. Also, again, talking about the vanishing hitchhiker story and urban legends in general, that's the big argument. Well, you never hear from the original person. It's always, you know, so-and-so's friend of a friend of a friend. That's true. This is a firsthand account. This is a firsthand... Which I'm in favor of. Right. This is a firsthand account of a guy I totally vouch for. Yeah. That I have been friends with and worked with for over 20 years. I know what kind of a dude he is. And if that's what he said happened, again, I can't tell him what happened. You know, I'm not sure. I don't think that the car was a ghostly apparition that levitated them down the road, but who knows? Maybe it was... If you were in the area, you might have just seen two hitchhiking dudes yes, floating in invisible chairs <laughs> flying down a, the highway. Well, that was our uh, one of our friends who actually we talked about in another story. That was her visual picture of seeing people down the LA freeway is a funny kind of thing, just yeah. without cars floating in a chair position. Yeah. Again, was that an interdimensional portal? Who can say? Was the car physical? Well, they got into something, and there was two people to witness it, so... That's what I like is that it's like that Twilight Zone where it's like the condemned person, the condemned man is going to be executed at midnight or have a judgment passed on, and it's a recurring nightmare, and all the parts just keep switching. One time he's the judge, one time he's the prosecutor, one time he's the defendant. 
it keeps switching around. So I think a lot of the same elements are there. And again, what's interesting is that he got an address and uh, couldn't find anything on it. It's like there hadn't been anything there, but they actually went to it. And is it just two old people having a laugh, pulling their leg <laughs> and somehow chitty, chitty, bang, bang, making the car disappear. So anyway, it's, it's a lot of elements I think that are interesting that fit within this, but in a different twist. So Scott, if you take this as to be a, a true story, and I know you just met Todd for the first time, but what do you think happened? Hmm. <laughs> I know it's, it's, that's the other thing I love, I love about the story. It's hard to wrap your head around. Yeah, I, I can't say. I don't know what I'll happened. that. There. You could say, well, this was a journey that happened in the, it was a personal experience and it happened sure. in his mind. But then again, somebody was with him. Yeah. And somebody yeah. who maybe wasn't as sure about what happened as he was. And they also covered some distance, or at least they thought they did. So that's a physical transportation of their bodies. Yeah. So if it's all in your head, how did you get further down the road? Exactly. So then the only other thing left would be if you were mistaken. And he has clearly stated that this was a sober experience. Afterward, he had some beers on the road with the Native Americans who gave him the next ride. And he had the experience with the highway patrolman. And he remembers all those details pretty well. So it's hard to imagine what exactly that was. I don't know. Yeah, that's a hard one to file. But like I said, is that part of just the folklore? Because imagine yourself that happening to you. It's like, well, I'm living an urban legend. You know, imagine that happening to you. It's like, well, where do you, where do you put that? You were part of a legend. So we're going to talk about that in our closing thoughts. But what's the status of Mary today? How is she treated in Chicago? Well, I will start off by saying she's still beloved. She's still remembered. Yeah, unlike the Chicago Mothman flap, I couldn't really find any spate of sightings with her. Maybe they're happening, but people aren't reporting them. Or so it's just so common. It's like, yeah, just file that away. It's, yeah. it's like the police yeah. station in justice. Like, yeah, you, you saw Mary. Okay, let's move on. I love how Adam said, well, it turns out those were all coming from one IP address. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, uh, that's interesting. To be investigated further later. If you're going to do something like that, get a Tor browser at least. <laughs> well, they put some thought into it, is yeah, what yeah. Scott's saying. But the, <laughs> the, the map is cool and the descriptions were. Yeah. But there's still stuff going on. I think there's still a Resurrection Mary Chicago 5K run. Yeah. Uh, and it's Big a deal. Uh, yeah, it's a run walk. The last time it was held on Saturday, October 21st, 2017. And the event raises money for a scholarship fund and that helps buy books and pay other expenses for District 109. And children and adults can participate. And it's a fun thing. People dress up for it. So it's one of those fun uh, run walks. That kind of illustrates, though, that she is still a local icon. And I would be willing to bet that she's still seen every once in a while, although it does appear that the 70s and early 80s were the flap, the spike in sightings. But I'll bet every once in a while she pops up on a road and people around the area know exactly who that is. And I'll bet she's often remembered as well in a lot of local traditions. Like if you go to Chet's Melody Lounge, <laughs> I believe every Halloween, the bartenders place a Bloody Mary for Mary at the end of the bar, just in case she's thirsty. Yeah. And of course they say sometimes they turn around, it's missing, but that's probably a they thirsty say, patron. Yeah. They also <laughs> say like, they think somebody just grabbed it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, hey, it's a free Bloody Mary. Come on. Yeah. It's like, she's not drinking it. Maybe she is. Yeah. I wouldn't want to upset her, but she doesn't seem like that kind of lady. No. La Llorona. No, I don't want to take her a drink. Yeah. No, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, again, all these places where something special, magical, weird, uh, maybe even frightening happened or tragic, you know, Roswell, Point Pleasant, all of them have their folklore and their central figure, whether it's an alien at the Little Alien Inn, excuse me, the Little Alien yes. in Roswell, or it's the Mothman Festival, or it's the Kecksburg Festival. You take whatever's happened and you commemorate it, and it becomes part of your identity. It's something you cherish. Kelly Hopkinsville. Kelly Hopkinsville. And so that's what you do with it. And uh, she's Chicago's own gal. Hopkinsville, home of Edgar Casey, by the way. That's right. Well, I just want to say, I think, you know, for my final thoughts and, and conclusions on this, I just would say it's been a very interesting ride exploring this story. I love like coming blind into something just only a month ago and then coming out feeling like no stone has been unturned. <laughs> yeah. I think that it's a mistake to try and corral all these cases into the folkloric version of Resurrection Mary that has developed. 
I think if you're out there and you think you see Resurrection Mary, you need to maybe not think of her as Resurrection Mary. Just open your mind to the details and what's going on so that you don't misinterpret anything. Don't let prior experience inform what you're seeing and then bring us a hyper-accurate version of what happened to you. I also am not convinced there's a Mary anywhere. I don't think there's a Mary. I think she represents something different, and I think she may also be a they. I'm not really sure, but whatever is going on here, I do believe that something real is happening. We've tracked down enough of these stories. A lot of them are secondhand, but we have spoken to some folks who had firsthand accounts. And between what we've learned through those firsthand accounts and the research that we've done and the stories that we hear about the police officer who told everyone at the station, oh, yeah, 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 we've all picked her up. When you start hearing about that and the the cab drivers and all the people that are seeing things, it does seem like something is happening. And this story, almost more than a lot of the other ones that we have covered, lends itself for me to something that maybe is being created by a collective unconsciousness. It it it, feels that way to me, which doesn't mean it's not real. Maybe not real in a corporeal form. Yeah. But real in that something is out there that you can see and that you can give a ride to. And uh, one thing that we didn't really touch on when we were talking about the folklore is that, I mean, we mentioned this a little bit, but there's this mention of Mary being a representation of lost innocence, this girl that can't go home because she's been tainted by the experience of going out dancing with boys or whatever else, and that this ride home is about that is an allegory or a a metaphor for not being able to get back to the pristine loss of innocence that she's had. All of this stuff is really interesting, and all of this applies to a lot of those cases from around the world. But whatever's happening, it seems like there's more to it. And I think it's a mistake to step back from this and say, ah, this is all just a bunch of urban legends. There's nothing happening here. This doesn't feel like that to me. I can see that in a smaller city, and I know this doesn't make sense. I can see that maybe even in in Jamestown, North Carolina, where I was talking about. It's a smaller town. It's this one story. It's this one spot. Maybe that sprang forth from that. But when you get to all of these dozens and dozens and dozens upon dozens of witnesses who are experiencing all these things, it starts to feel more like there is something there at its root. However, As with all urban legends and even ones that get as big as this one's gotten, I do believe there is a fair amount of hoaxing mixed in with everything else. There's no question these guys are going out there. They're dousing themselves in glow stick fluid and standing out in the woods on the side of the road at Halloween and all that sort of thing. And people are probably seeing them and that gets lumped in with all the other stories. But I still think that there's a good portion of these stories that are true. And I think only one of them has to be true for something to be up. Well, I, yeah, I, it's all food for thought because we've brought up all these points earlier. You have a, a lot of them, Scott. You know, what's going on here? So as I was making the case for this ginormous outline that we, we've tried to tackle here, you know, you were asking me, it's like, well, what's the commonality here? What's the point of parts three and four? And it's like, well, it's to step back and see all the patterns, all the commonalities without telling the story over and over again. But to ask the question and to approach an answer of what is going on here? Because what we found with our research, and so has everybody, is that like La Llorona, she could be 500 years old, but there's no origin story. And with Mary, there is no Mary. There is no story, no incident you could point to. Like Beardsley and Hanky, you can't get to an origin story of like, oh, well, here's this young gal who was 23 and she died in a hit and run accident on a December night wearing a white dress and she was buried at Resurrection Cemetery and her name was blank. And that's who we think it is. There really isn't one. There's a few candidates, but they don't all line up. So maybe, like Richard Crow said, maybe there's several ladies who met with a tragic end who wandered that street, that stretch of Archer Road forever trying to get home. Who knows? Or if, again, this is my point, if you step back and look at all the similarities to all these stories, everything that's going on, what is going on around the world? Are they all Marys? Are they all not Marys, if you know what I'm saying? They are a supernatural symbol for something else that's happening. 
what are people seeing? Because I do, like you said, I do believe people are seeing something. And that's the old question about everybody knows these stories. You know, the debunker would say like, well, people all know these stories. So they're imagining these things. Your brain fills in the details and uh, you picked up something you didn't know what you uh, were doing here. You were hallucinating in some way. You were preconditioned to see this. Of course, you're culturally conditioned to see whoever your Mary is. Or you can say, well, I think that people are seeing things independent of their regional and personal and cultural folklore. They're just seeing stuff and they're reporting it. And that turns into folklore. I think my answer is a combination of all that. If you can't answer the question of who Mary is, you look at what Mary is. And to the folklorist, well, they don't care about the veracity of finding a person. They want to know how her story affects culture and people and society and our legends and folklore. That's what they do. That's the thing that they can quantify. How far does the story spread? How does it make people feel? What does it add to their personal lives and their, their own stories and their own upbringings? Because she's so much more, and that's my point. She's a ghost story. She's a paranormal encounter. She's a cultural archetype. She's a cautionary tale. She's an urban legend. She's a vanishing hitchhiker. And she's a lady in white. She's all of those things. There is no singular Mary. But what we found around the world is that there's always a Mary. She's a tragic figure, like a lot of these ladies in white, and there's a sad sweetness about her. She's not out for vengeance. She doesn't want to harm anyone. She may scare you inadvertently, but what she wants is what any ghost wants, to be at peace. She wants to go to a place of rest. She wants to go home. That's going to wrap up our series on Resurrection Mary. We're dark next week for our travel to the Kent Paranormal Weekend in Ohio. Reminder, we'll be back the week after that with an exciting new show with Bill Snavely, the only man looking for Amelia Earhart who has actually found an airplane. Most people have no idea who he is, but his story is incredibly compelling, so come back for that for sure. Please remember to support our sponsors. They keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Tony. Hi, I'm Tony. Hi. Hi, I'm Tony. Hi, I'm Joe Harmon. I'm Elise. Hi, I'm Tony. Future Compensation. Our show is edited by Sarah Wendell, and our theme, which is available as a ringtone, is by Judson Crane. Sound design is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to The Ark and its lead researcher, Tess Feifel. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also find us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends if you'd like to support the show in that way. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night.